call this meeting to order. May we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Blanco? Here. Commissioner Lopez? Here. Commissioner Dickerson? Here. Commissioner Mohajer? Here. Chair Seifert? Here. Uh, can I have a uh, motion to approve the Planning Commission meetings, uh, commission, Planning Commission minutes of February 15th? I'll move to uh, approve those minutes. I have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we made it. Uh, at this time, we're going to have a public comment period, and Dana's going to uh, give us some instruction. Thank you, uh, Chair Seifert, and good evening, Commissioners. Um, this is Dana Eady, the Planning Manager. Um, if you wish to comment on an agenda item, please, and you're on Zoom, please use the raised hand icon on the Zoom platform. And once you are recognized, you will then be unmuted and allowed to comment on the business at hand in the order received. The maximum comment time is three minutes or is otherwise directed by the chair. And if you are calling in on Zoom and you wish to be acknowledged, um, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine and then identify yourself when unmuted. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Uh, do we have anyone that wishes to speak? Something not on the agenda tonight. Do we have anyone I, on Zoom? I do have one hand raised on Zoom. Perfect. Okay, you should uh, be allowed to um, speak now, and if you could please um, give us your name. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Felix Esparza. I am a San Maria resident and a retired police officer from the city of Santa Maria. And I am here to speak in support of the Blossom Ranch future development. My experience in Santa Maria was working as a police officer for 25 years. Excuse me? I have been retired for the last... I'm so sorry to interrupt My you, um, but this is actually for items that aren't on the agenda, and we're going to have the Vlasa Ranch item come up later in the agenda, and then we'll have a designated public comment time for that item. So if you can just hang I on for a little while, we'll have you back on. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank both of you very much. Um, do we have anyone else that wishes to speak? Uh, seeing none, we're going to move into the public hearings. Uh, an item number one has, um, is going to come to us to ask for a continuation. Dana? Thank you. Yes, so um, staff is requesting that item one be continued to the uh, next planning commission hearing, which is on April 5th. And um, the reason for the continuance is that the applicant is currently working on revising their plans and uh, they'll be ready to go for that meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, commissioners, um, has anyone uh, spoke to anybody about this conserve gas station? Ex parte? Uh, there's gonna be no presentation, obviously. Uh, do I need to do anything else other than just, what, what, what do we need, public hearing? Yeah, we do need a motion and a second for the continuance. Do we need to bring a public hearing up for this, for a continuance? Okay, no. so do I hear a motion? Yeah, I move that we continue uh, item conserve fuel plan development permit amendment at 1027 East Soul Road to April 5th uh, Planning Commission meeting. A second. Mr. Chairman, I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No abstentions. Uh, motion carries. Uh, we're going to have one other change of the agenda tonight. Uh, at this time, we're going to move item five up. Uh, the uh, Dignity Moves Hope Village Project informational briefing. Thank Dana. you, um, Chair Seifert. So um, we do have Terry Moss Nisich here from the County of Santa Barbara, and she's going to be uh, giving the presentation uh, for this project. Thank you. 
Good evening, Chair, members of the Commission. Again, Terry Nisich, Assistant County Executive Officer with the County of Santa Barbara. Uh, I have with me tonight representatives of our service team for the Dignity Moves Project, Kirsten Calhoun from Good Sam, uh, Edwin Weaver from Fighting Back Santa Maria, and then we also have a representative of Dignity Moves, the construction branch, Derek Troy with us today in case you have any questions. Um, I'll go ahead and move through the presentation. Hopefully this works. There we go. So a little bit about the project. This is a temporary interim supportive housing project um, within the city of Santa Maria, which is intended to serve the Santa Maria Valley. It's Good Sam, Fighting Back, Dignity Health, Common Spirit, or otherwise known as Marion Regional Medical Center, are collaborative partners. And we have a shared mission to serve clients that are currently experiencing homelessness within the Santa Maria Valley. Presently, over 550 temporary beds are needed countywide to address our homeless needs, and over 130 of those are located in the North County area. So this project seeks to address that shortfall. We are prioritizing placement in Hope Village for those currently experiencing homelessness in the Santa Maria Valley. We are not, we often get asked this question, individuals from Santa Barbara, South County will not be coming up to North County, just as with our South County project, um, North County individuals are not uh, brought into the South County project. We're really trying to make this a locally serving project. Um, we want Our strategy is that we maximize the use of underutilized land on a temporary basis, and I'll talk a little bit about that later in the presentation. And this is a short-term strategy to establish beds, to provide service, while we continue to work on longer-term permanent housing solutions. And this also addresses a need where congregate shelters, while very helpful to our continuum of services, do not meet all of the needs of individuals. So as you'll see in this presentation, these are individualized rooms for individuals to seek shelter. I talked a little bit about the bed needs. This is just another snapshot of what we're looking at countywide. Um, you can see here again, we have the need of over 550 beds. And then I have broken that out by our needs throughout the various regions to give you an, a sense of what we're looking at in terms of an overall countywide strategy to provide for beds. One more shot. As I talked about, over 550 beds, to be more exact, 563 temporary beds are needed countywide. We currently have 140 that we've recently put in place within the county. And in the pipeline, we have 123 beds, so we have a shortfall of 300 beds. And again, this project will seek to resolve much of that shortfall. This is last year's point in time count. A point in time count, if you're not familiar, is when a number of our agencies go out and take a snapshot of where homeless are residing throughout the county. This is a snapshot of the 2022 point in time, which reflects various areas throughout the Santa Maria Valley where individuals or encampments have been cited. Let me tell you a little bit about the project specifically. The timeline is that is very similar. Uh, it's actually very uh, uh, bifurcated in the fact that since these are temporary units, they are modular and completed off-site. So typically, our timeline for the actual construction of the project is anywhere between four, to, or four or five, six months once we actually kick off construction. Our goal is to build 94 units at this particular location. There'll be 54 cabins for those that are considered to be chronically homeless, 10 cabins for transitional age youth, or those 18 to 24, and 30 cabins will be dedicated to Marion Regional Medical Center's efforts uh, for respite care for homeless individuals discharged from the hospital system. The duration of the project, we anticipate being on site for five years. We recently executed a lease. Our Board of Supervisors adopted the lease and uh, right of entry agreement, as well as the development management agreement with Dignity Moves, and that lease is written for five years. Similar projects, we do have a project very similar to this down in South County, and I'll show you some uh, pictures of that as we move forward so you can get a sense of what the actual village would look like. A little bit more about some of our features of the project. 
Uh, as I mentioned, um, we have a number of different types of cabins. Ten of the respite units will have ensuite restrooms uh, to assist individuals in their recuperative care needs. Um, others will have single and double units so that individuals, if they are with a partner, they can come in and, um, and remain together um, as part of their housing journey. In terms of the population, as I mentioned previously, we have specialty units um, for a number of individuals experiencing homelessness, and then general units um, overall. Some of our amenities in terms of what you'll see on the site, not only do we have the individualized cabins, but we have uh, congregate facilities for dining, laundry facilities. We also have case management offices. And in this particular project, because we do have a little bit of extra room on site, we're also going to have a pet run. Um, one of the things that we know about our homeless population is they oftentimes have pets. And sometimes needing to leave their pet means that they will not come into um, housing services. So this allows them to bring their pets with them and begin their journey to find permanent supportive housing. In terms of services, this, there will be wraparound case management services provided by Good Sam. Um, they are the designated provider on the site, and they have an excellent track record of success in serving our, our homeless and moving them through the continuum of care. They are also our provider at the South County site and doing a wonderful job. One of the things we'd like to point out about the types of services, there is 24-7 staffing. We will also have 24-7 security on the site. A couple highlights of the proposed project. What's going to be built? One of the things we're working to do is we're breaking down the barriers to accept housing. So what does that mean? Uh, we're going to have privacy. People will have a dignified room. They can go in, uh, go in close their doors, relax. Um, they will not be in a congregate setting. As I mentioned before, pets are welcome. Partners are welcome. We do have some double facilities. Typically, they're single bed units, but many, several of them will be double bed. Um, their possessions are safe and secure. One of the other amenities on the side is we will have storage. Obviously, many times people bring with them quite a bit of, of materials um, when they are on the streets. This offers an opportunity for them to put things in the room, lock them safely, but we'll also have other storage amenities on site as well. And then this is a shot of some of the uh, services or some of the facilities in South County. We wanted to show you obviously one of the typical rooms, what the restroom facilities look like, the dining areas, and the laundry facilities. In terms of the overall management, residents must agree to create a plan with their case manager to address any treatment needs they may have, and then as I've mentioned a couple times, is really begin a, a plan for their housing journey. Uh, they agree to abide by community rules. There is curfew. People can, in fact, leave the site for jobs or other appointments, but there is a curfew and there are rules that Good, ha Good Sam holds everyone accountable to. Um, there is no drug or alcohol use permitted on the site. So where is this site? Uh, if you could point out the left-hand parcel, that might work better with your mouse. Um, we are on Southside Parkway. This is immediately, there you go, thank you, immediately adjacent to the Betteravia campus, the county administration building, our social <coughs> services facility, our public health facility. Um, we'll get, actually gain entrance to the property from south side. Just another shot of the actual parcel and the proposed entry area. This is an overview of the actual site. Again, you can see the entry and parking off of Southside Parkway, some of the additional cabins and the community gathering area, pet area, and general, and general facilities. It is completely fenced. We are planning on artwork around the perimeter, primarily on, on the primary roadway. And at the actual entryway, I'll show you a, a photo in just a minute, um, we have been working with a local architect to give us feedback about the look and feel, some of the things that might represent the Santa Maria community, uh, and then also have some additional uh, uh, murals um, to decorate the entryways. Another view of the site, and again, just reinforcing how those 94 units will be allocated. Again, 54 for adults, 10 units for transitional age youth, and then 30 for respite care.
So in terms of planning, a little bit more about the project in this regard. Gensler, which is one of the leading global architects, is uh, the architect of record on this project. They work with Dignity Moves on a number of their projects, not only our Santa Barbara project, uh, but other projects throughout the state. It is on county-owned land, uh, and we are using American Rescue Act, or ARPA money, has been dedicated by the Board of Supervisors to this project, $2 million. The first million is for capital. The second million is to go towards provision of services on the site. In terms of partnerships, we have a substantial amount of philanthropy committed to this project. As I mentioned, while the county has a million dollars, Marion Regional Medical Center is bringing $2 million in capital, and the remainder is through philanthropic fundraising. So a significant effort uh, coming to bear to fund the capital facilities on this particular project. The city, we've been working with your city staff and we're very appreciative for all of the support that they've provided as we've worked through this project. Um, obviously we've gone through the 65402 project, uh, process that's been deemed approved after the 40 day period. I should also note that our annual operating costs on this site are a little over one and a half million dollars. Um, that is primarily, again, with our ARPA monies, and then we're also using Medi-Cal and other sources to provide for that ongoing 1.6 million, and then I reference the capital contribution. A little bit more about some of our work. Um, we have worked with both city and county fire to achieve our fire plan review that is completed. Um, final plan checks are underway with our third party, Will Dan. Uh, we are currently working with PG&E to complete the engineering and connection details for the site. And then of course we're working with your city staff to complete all of the utility connections and encroachment permits and make sure that we're meeting all of your needs in that regard. I like to show these slides because it shows what we uh, originally envisioned for Santa Barbara and what we delivered. Uh, so on the left is the actual design of the entryway to the Santa Barbara site, and on the right-hand side is the actual site. And on the bottom is a view of the cabins themselves, and the right is the actual project. This is a view of Hope Village. This is what we envision for that entryway. Uh, as you can see, a nicely fenced arched entryway, some artwork in the opening areas. Um, we uh, plan to have food truck, food service uh, at times on the site. And then the second shot that I wanted to provide you with is a look at the interior, that primary gathering area that's envisioned for the site. We have done quite a bit of outreach and engagement. Um, we wanted to make sure that the surrounding area was aware of what was being proposed. Uh, and we also began work early on back in June in discussing the project with, with the city. Uh, so we've talked to the city on a number of occasions. Again, we've been working with your staff. Uh, we've met with the residents on one occasion. Uh, and we've also had frequent meetings with various businesses in the area. We also met with our county employees. As I pointed out, there is uh, our campus surrounds the site and we wanted to make sure that they were aware. Uh, I did want to point out that while we are highlighting that outreach and engagement, outreach and engagement is ongoing. Once we're under construction, we will still have a point of contact. We will still have our website. We will have liaisons. So in case people had issues about the project or had any questions about the project, there will always be a, a point of contact for people to reach out to and get any questions answered. And that is the project. I'm happy to answer any questions or our service representatives are here as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Commissioners, questions? Uh, well, I have some. Sure. Um, how did you come up with a five-year lease? You mean the time frame of the project, yes. Chair? Yes. Uh, we've always looked at either a three or five year time frame. We believe because of there were 94 units, we believe that a five year time frame would be more prudent for a project of this size. Uh, I, I assume the plan check is coming from the county, encroachment permits are coming from the city? Yes, that's correct. Uh, you said no drugs or alcohol on site. But that doesn't mean it's drug free. That just means nothing on site. The, the, is there some sort of regulation against people 
using, or how does that work? Exactly. Drug and alcohol is not permitted on site. Um, one of the things we can do is have Kirsten speak very specifically to their management policies and how they specifically management the treatment and, and some of the rules and regulations that govern inappropriate use or, or something found on site. And, and uh, just one thing, uh, that picture you showed was real nice of that one uh, in, in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. We have a dirt lot. Uh, is that planned on being developed into like an asphalt parking lot or something? Or yes, what do you got sections of the site will in fact be paved. Uh, we will also have uh, decking throughout the site as well. And then we'll, there will also be DG in various areas of the site as well. Yeah, it'll be a, a mixture of surface treatments, frankly. Great. Yes, Commissioner Dickerson. Thank you, Chair. Um, the five-year plan, the 94? 94. 94 units. Uh, how long, what's the general expectation for length of stay for a client in your, in your facility? Typically, they are there anywhere. Well, well, I should say they can be there up to six months, correct, typically. Um, it's anywhere nine, from 90 days up to about six months. So we would anticipate on, on the lower scale that we would have 94 times two coming through the site um, in, any, in the fiscal year. So serving over 180, 190 individuals uh, okay. over a year. Okay. And, and are they allowed back in? So once they've gone through that six month process, two years down the road, could they come back? That's a good question. Kirsten, you want to answer Thank that you. one? In terms of, I'm, I'm never going to assume that I know all the service details. That's why I'm going to turn it over to Kirsten. No, the, the, the question was um, if a client is there for six months, leaves, could they come back in two years? Or basically, if they had their, you know, they're up to bat and it's time for somebody else. So usually, if a client leaves um, prior to them finding permanent housing, it's a year until they can come back into one of our programs. Um, because this is a referral-based program, this isn't a walk-in shelter, so the list is going to be created by um, outreach prior to the opening and referrals from um, local service providers. They would have to go to the bottom of the list again, and it would probably be a year at least before they can go in okay. again. Thank you. And then uh, one other question, where's the water coming from? We are working with um, on uh, your city on um, yeah, all the water connections. So. Okay. Yeah. So it's and be one city other thing water. I'd like to point out, and, and Kirsten, thank you for reminding me. Um, I showed the slide of the um, point in time count. So one of the things, once we're ready to ramp up and begin entry and admission to the site, we will again be out mapping the areas and then doing, Good Sam will be doing the outreach to identify those individuals to come on into the site. And that would begin several months into, before we actually populated the site. So um, that won't even begin for a couple months from now. But all of those individuals, we'd be working with them to get them into our, our homeless management information system um, and making sure that everything is lined up for them to, to come on into the site. So I neglected to mention that earlier. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Blanco. Uh, just one question, uh, Chair. In terms of timeline, I might have missed it, but is there, what's the construction estimated timeline right now? When would you start, maybe end? We need that site to dry out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it's true. Been really rainy. Uh, once we actually start construction, we initially hoped to be in construction in, in late March, early April. Obviously, that's a bit delayed for a number of reasons. And then once we actually start construction, uh, it'll be about a five to six month construction timeline. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner. What, one last one. It's, so you're going to be there for five years, and then the theory is that you're going to pack up and move to another community. Is that right? Yes, Commissioner, that's correct. And that's what we have planned for our South County site as well. That happens to be a three-year lease. It's a smaller project. But yes, after five years, the way the lease is structured, uh, we'll be looking for a different site. And the county has the opportunity to retain those units and move them to a different site. Or Dignity Moves has the opportunity um, to retain those units and move them to another site out of the county. In, in the South County site that's already up and running, how long have you been there so far? We've been there since November. Okay, so you'll have up to about three years, so, right. you, so you probably have not decided where to go with that one yet. 
Correct. We have the same arrangement in that, uh, in fact, in that instance, um, we'd be working with Good Sam on potential placement of those. They are our operator uh, down in, in South County. Um, we do have plans to put a permanent supportive housing site on that land in South County after that three-year time frame. Um, so we will be moving that project elsewhere. And we do already have people interested in the units. Thank you. I don't think we have any other questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much for having us. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank Chair you. Chair Seifert, I think we yes, do, um, although this is an informational briefing, I think we do need to still have public comment on the item. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay. Uh, at this time, we'll open it up for public comment. Uh, do we have anyone on Zoom? I do not see any hands raised. Do we have anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this? I see no one. Okay, bring it back. Uh, we're going to move on. Thank you very much. Okay. At this time, we're going to go to uh, the item mark number two, Honda Detail Building Plan Development Permit at 1735 South Bradley Road. Dana. Thank you, Mr. Staff. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank Sorry. you, Chair Seifert. Um, my name is Carol Dizaheni. I'm a senior planner presenting the project this evening. This is a new detail building that would be detached um, from the existing Honda dealership uh, building, but ancillary to the dealership use for exclu exclusive use by Honda. Um, this project is before your commission tonight because the building was not included in the prior plan development permit. Um, for Honda, the, the dealership itself, so and all new construction requires a plan development permit in the plan development overlay. So the project is located just south of Meehan between Shepherd and Bradley Road. The project site is in a general commercial district with a plan development auto and freeway tower overlay. Um, this is specific for the auto dealerships um, in the Enos Ranch specific, specific plan. The project site is surrounded by auto dealerships and other automotive uses to the north and south, with an elementary school to the west across Shepherd Drive, over here, and then Costco across Bradley Road to the east. So again, this is um, within the Enos Ranch specific plan. In early 2016, the City Council approved the specific plan and certified the supplemental EIR. Uh, the specific plan included the Enos Ranch Shopping Center in Area 1, which is right over here, Costco in Area 2, which is across the road, and then the auto dealerships in Area 4 here. To ensure new sales and auto dealerships were provided, the City Council placed a new auto sales overlay on Area 4. Um, and so just a little bit more information, the Enos um, Historic House um, TI, tenant improvement for the office use was issued um, the building permit was issued in 20, uh, November 2022. Um, so the project site is located in this yellow square here, but the specific project is in this corner, the northern corner of the project. Um, so here, here is the aerial overlay showing that project site. Um, it's closer to Shepherd and Meehan um, within an existing service parking area. There's about 10 parking spaces in this area. And so the, the dealership does have uh, rooftop parking. I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, so this is a 1,750 square foot, one story detail building. It's about 19 feet tall. Um, again, I'm just gonna bring your attention to the, the location of the detail building. It will be separate from the, the dealership. The existing detail service bay is just right over here. So it would just be across the drive aisle. Um, and then the bottom photo is just showing, again, that detail bay over here. This is the existing Honda building, and this is a view from Shepherd from the elementary school looking across the street, and the project site is right over here, um, just next to that blue car. Um, so uh, the project includes two bays um, and some se secured uh, storage area. Uh, existing landscaping for the project is preserved at 12%, which was approved by uh, Planning Commission and it, it is con conditioned to be protected with this permit. So any landscape that would be 
accidentally trodden on or, or disturbed would be conditioned to be replaced and um, preserved. The project meets height and setback requirements for the C2 district in the Eno specific plan. Um, so um, it also meets the on-site parking requirements as well. So the, the dealership was overparked. It provides about 200 spaces for inventory and display. The 184 spaces shown on the screen is calculated to include both the dealership with um, the 20, existing 23 service bays, um, as well as employee and customer parking. And then again, the 195 spaces for inventory and display. So essentially what the parking does is um, kind of just relocate some of the service parking um, off to, to the south over here. This was slated for inventory. Um, storage but they're they're going to utilize the honda is going to utilize the some of that inventory space for the the needed customer parking and employee parking so here are a few photos of the site um, number one is just showing another view of the location for the proposed building in the background is the honda building I'm also showing some of the um, photos of the rear of the building with that ramp up to the second floor inventory storage area. Um, the aluminum composite material panels on the back and the gray you see here are proposed on the building, the proposed detail building. Um, the architect has proposed a kind of a lighter cream color um, consistent with the building in the front. Um, and um, the climbing vines that you see um, most prominently on, on image three are also proposed on this new detail building. So here's just a floor plan. Again, there's the two standard size ba service bays, and then there's some storage in the rear of the building, and then along this area as well. Um, the, in the next couple slides, I'll kind of show you um, some details about the, the bay doors and, and what all that will look like. Um, the storage areas are proposed to be secured with a full height chain link fence. So here are the elevations of the building. It's in keeping with the design, the architecture of the existing dealership. There's some um, diagonal angles to keep in keeping with the elementary school across the street, as well as the, the driveway up. And again, those ACM panels, aluminum panels, are proposed um, to gel with the, the architecture. Um, this is a, a view of the bay doors, just a, kind of across the way. The, the service area in the, in the rear, showing um, those aluminum panels again, but with the color shown on the left here. And then again with these climbing vines on the Shepherd Drive side of the building. And so these are just opposing, so the doors would be facing Bradley Road. So the building height is a maximum of 19 feet, but it would slope down to between 11 and 16 feet. With that, um, staff recommends that the Planning Commission by motion approve Plan Development Permit PD 2022-0012. The applicant is uh, present this evening, and staff and the applicant are available for any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, do we have any ex parte on this? No one? Okay. Um, did we have any questions for staff? Uh, do we, uh, Jacob, are you ready to do a uh, presentation? Please state your name and address for the record. Hello, Jacob Weintraub. Um, I'd like, just like to thank Carol for working with me on this and, and Dana for her help as well and the commission for uh, the hearing tonight. I don't have much to say. Carol did a wonderful job uh, presenting. I guess the only thing that I would add is that we're going to be using the building also for our e, uh, EV readiness that Honda is pushing. Uh, they're asking us to start uh, installing high-level high EV charging stations uh, and some additional equipment. So uh, we're still going to be washing the vehicles in the wash bay, but we're going to be coming out of the wash bay and detailing them in this building and then also um, utilizing it for the additional equipment that Honda is asking for uh, for EV readiness. So we're excited about that as well. So I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. 
commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Mahart. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to be cognizant of the school across the street. Um, do we know details regarding business operations as to the turnover rates of vehicles coming in and out of service through that entrance right in front of the school? Yeah, the, the flow of traffic will not change in and out of the site. We're not, uh, it's not increasing at all or decreasing. Thank you. And then I guess this is a question for staff. Um, have we had a traffic study done there? I know that's a pretty heavy traffic area because of Costco and the Ozara parking or apartments. Thank you. Um, so with the, the Enos Ranch specific plan, there was a master uh, environmental document that was prepared, including study of traffic. Um, as this is an ancillary use to the existing dealership, it was, um, uh, th there would be no increase in traffic. It would essentially be a continuation of the services provided by Honda. Um, so um, uh, Engineer M Mueller can kind of speak to that a little bit more if, if, if requested. Yeah, Commissioner Mahajer, the, there are no additional traffic impacts that determined by this uh, proposed construction. The additional trips, if any, uh, were deemed insignificant. Um, there haven't been any traffic collisions recorded at this dri at the driveway uh, between the um, school and Honda, so uh, safety was not deemed to be a concern on for this project. Perfect. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Blanco. Quick question um, for storage. <clears throat> excuse me. Storage is going to be enclosed inside the building. All storage of items for detailing and plus the EV redness stuff that was talked about? Yeah, there's going to be a small storage area outside, uh, but it's going to be enclosed, correct? Thank you. Additional questions? No, I see none. Um, I, I've got a question about the, just the charging itself. Uh, so you, you've got to bring in all this high power. Uh, I know that you probably had pg &E come out and do your initial building and they did a, a, a study of how much power you needed and everything. What happens when you go back to pg &E and you say we need all these charging stations? How exactly does that work for you guys? I mean, you've got to bring in a whole other transmission line or is that something that you already have on site? It's just, it's just actually kind of a question of how it, how it works. Sure. Um, good question. We did initially design the uh, the main service to handle uh, EV charging. Probably not the amount of EG char EV charging we'll eventually need, um, but we do have existing capacity uh, with the existing service to handle the uh, demands that they're asking for currently. And then can we go to the site plan? I keep seeing a sign for a car wash. Isn't that uh, adjacent to this project? The empty lot is the car wash, correct? That's correct. And then the parking behind the car wash, is that part of your project now? It, what, what is that? I don't remember that. That's a separate lot. F for your use, for the dealer's use? Currently, it's a retail lot. Um, but we're using it for parking right now, and that's uh, under a separate PD, I believe. Yeah, I believe so. Okay, that's an, that's all I have. Thank you. No other questions. Okay, at this time I'm. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. This time I'm going to open the uh, meeting up to the public. Uh, I don't see any written communications on this. Do we have anyone on Zoom or anyone in the audience? Um, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item and you're on Zoom, um, just go ahead and raise your hand, please. I see no hands raised. I don't see anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on this. Uh, I'm going to bring that back. Um, anything back from the commission? No? Okay. Uh, can I hear a motion or... Yeah, thank you. I'll go ahead and move that um, by motion we uh, approve the Honda Detail Building Plan Development Permit at 1735 a South Bradley Road. Um, 
PD 2022-0012. Do I hear a second? I'll second that motion. And can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Dickerson? Yes. Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner Mohajer? Aye. Commissioner Lopez? Aye. Chair Seifert? Aye. Motion passed. Thank you. We're going to move on to item number three. Uh, Sisters of St. Francis tentative t uh, parcel map time extension at 124 South College Drive. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, commissioners. This is Dana Ed, planning manager. And this is a request for a one-year time extension for a tentative parcel map that was approved um, in December of 2019. So this is the project site. Um, the site's located, um, it's the Sisters of St. Francis site, and it's just east of College Drive and south of Main Street. It has two separate zoning districts on it. Um, it's got a plan development overlay with a commercial professional office zoning on the northern part of the property and then a medium density residential or R2 zoning on the southern part. Um, and then just east of this site, there's some single family residential development um, and also some additional PDCPO development as well. So this is the approved tentative parcel map. Um, it subdivided the site, the 6.9 acre lot, I should say, into three lots. Again, it was approved in December eight, on December 18th of 2019. And tentative parcel map approvals are valid for three years from the date of the Planning Commission's approval. But Title 11 of uh, the Municipal Code does allow for one year time extensions. And so in this case, the applicant is requesting an extension to December 18th of 2023 to uh, record the final map. And they're currently working on getting that completed. So um, with that, the Planning Commission, uh, staff recommends that the Planning Commission by motion approve plan Permit Amendment A 2022-15. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana. Do we have any ex parte? Nope. Uh, are we going to have an applicant presentation on this? Laurie Tamura, please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Laurie Tamura with Urban Planning Concepts. Uh, thank you very much for um, considering this time extension. Uh, the Sisters of St. Francis, who are also connected with Dignity Health, uh, have been working with um, several developers to help them with this project. And um, they have now partnered up with uh, Nick Tompkins as well as uh, People Self Help Housing. So uh, the work is ready to move forward with the recordation of this parcel map as well as um, submittal of additional development plans that will be coming forward to the Planning Commission. So this additional time will um, help us uh, complete those uh, final documents for recordation and then on with the development plan. So we appreciate uh, your time and look forward to an approval of this time extension. Uh, thank you very much, Lori. Do we have any questions? Mm, seeing none. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll open up to the public. Do we have anyone on Zoom wishes to speak? Anyone in the public, the audience? Uh, Chair Seifert, I'm, I'm not seeing any hands raised, no. I see no one that wishes to speak on this. We're going to bring this back to the uh, uh, commission. Public hearings closed. Do we have a motion? Discussion. I just had one question. Is there a historical designation to this building at all? Commissioner Lopez, um, you know, I don't recall that it is listed on our um, list of historic structures, but I don't have it in front of me. I can look it up and get back to you, though. Okay. It may be. I mean, it is an older building and probably would qualify, but I would need to just look at our list. No, it's just a question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Uh, 
Would anyone like to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the Planning Commission by resolution approve the permit amendment A2022-0015. Do I hear a second? I second that motion. May we have a roll call, please? <clears throat> Commissioner Lopez? Aye. Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner Dickerson? Aye. Commissioner Mohajer? Aye. Chair Seifert? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to item number four. Uh, the Blosser Ranch Single Family Residential Subdivision, lots eight and 10, planned development permit and vesting tentative track map at the northeast corner of South Blosser Road and West Battles Road. Is this Dana? Thank you very much. Thank you, so this is Dana Eady, planning manager. Um, so this is the Blosser Ranch Single Family Residential Subdivision. Um, and it's a request for a plan development permit and a tract map. So this is the project site. It is located within a portion of the Blosser Southeast Area 5B specific plan. Um, this property is located at the northeast corner of Blosser Road and Battles Road. Um, Manami Park is to the east as well as Adams School the fairgrounds is up to the northeast. Um, surrounding development is predominantly residential, so there's single family residential development just to the south, and there's some multifamily residential and single family residential to the west. So the Vlaster Southeast Area 5B specific plan was adopted by the city council in September of 2020. The plan provides the framework for future development of the site. It includes standards and criteria for development, such as community design standards for residential and commercial development, um, direction regarding amenities. Um, there's a future regional sports complex that would be um, constructed on a, a portion of the site that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, pocket parks as well as uh, direction on transportation and circulation improvements and utilities. So this is the uh, current zoning and land use designations of the site. Uh, approximately 59 acres is zoned for single family residential development. And then there are separate lots that are zoned for uh, higher density um, multifamily residential, that's the R3 zoning. So that would be this site here. Well, I'll have my one moment. Just turning on the laser pointer. <laughs> okay. So we have high density residential in this location and up at the north. And then there's some commercial zoning here. And then this area is zoned for a new school. And then along the eastern side, uh, there's about just under 20 acres that zone for open space for the future development of the regional sports complex. So the project that we have uh, before you this evening is to subdivide and develop lots eight and 10 of the overall master tract map for area 5B. And so that's these two lots here, these are eight and 10. Um, there will be future um, applications coming to your commission for other um, areas within the subdivision, so specifically lots nine and 11 for single family dwelling, uh, single family residential. And then we also have an application in for lot seven, which is for multifamily uh, apartment units. And um, also I did wanna mention that uh, recently the applicant has entered into a memorandum of, of understanding with the city um, to convey the um, lot six, which is the um, open space area, to the city um, for the future development of the park. And um, they've also agreed to uh, set aside two acres of, of land on lot one in exchange for um, credits to, for their AB 1600 fees. And um, the applicant's gonna speak more on that in their presentation. But um, the Rec and Parks Depart 
Recreation and Parks Department is currently in the process of uh, having the sports complex designed. And so this is a really important amenity uh, for this project and for the Santa Maria area uh, as a whole. So this is the uh, proposed tentative tract map. Um, it includes 106 lots for the development of 105 single family dwellings. Um, the lots range in size from around 4,000 square feet up to 7,400 square feet. The density is right around six dwelling units per acre, which is below the eight dwelling units per acre maximum for the R1 zone. 96 of the lots are proposed to be developed with an accessory dwelling unit. It's a, a detached accessory dwelling unit. And those units would be permitted separately with a building permit. So approval of the accessory dwelling units is not a part of the plan development permit tonight, but the applicant has um, included the ADUs um, on the site for design purposes. So um, all of the units within the development are proposed to be rented. So this is what's considered to be a build for rent community. Um, the roads are 24 feet in width and would all be private roads. Um, so this is intended to be a gated uh, community that is privately maintained. And access to the site is provided from Western Avenue. So there's an entrance and an exit from Western and then an exit only onto La Brea. And these, uh, these access points are to be gated. So this is an example of the private road section um, that the applicant is, is proposing to build. Again, it's 24 feet in width. Uh, so you have 12 foot wide, uh, 12 foot wide uh, drive aisles, and then you have some uh, four foot wide walkways, and, um, and then there's driveways adjacent to it. And so for comparison, I just wanted to include the city's typical um, standard local road section um, which is 12 foot wide lanes uh, with eight foot parking on each side and then a six foot to 10 foot wide sidewalk. Uh, but again, these are private roads and the applicant would be privately maintaining them. The city would not be maintaining these roads. And I'm sorry, so what's the total for, for the, um, if it was a city road? It's 24 feet for their roads, what's? So um, you have 24 feet plus the eight, Math is not my strong point. Um, yeah, about 40. 40. And the 24 foot wide roads within this subdivision that, that are being proposed do not have on site parking. There is guest parking, which I will get to in the next slide. So um, this shows, this slide shows the pedestrian walkways that the applicant has designed within the subdivision. Um, all of the walkways connect out to either Western or La Brea and connect through the site. Um, there is no on-street parking, but they have included um, a total of 57 guest parking spaces, and those are shown on this slide here. So there's, a, there's six spaces here, six here, five here, three. So you can see another 10 here next to the community center and then some additional parking along the edges here. So the, um, the subdivision does include a number of different types of parks and open space areas, and they're shown um, in this slide here. So um, I'll just walk through a few of them. So there's a seating area pointed out here. It's pretty much everywhere you see green space. Um, there's a pocket park, another park here. Um, there is a pet park down in this area of the site. And then there's a community center, which I will get into more details uh, in a few more slides, but it's, uh, this community center has quite a few amenities associated with it, like a pool and a spa, barbecue areas. Um, and then there's some additional seating areas here, as well as up through here. And then I took these slides just directly from the plans. It just gives an idea of um, the type of amenities that would be provided. These ones down here on the bottom are related to the community center, and then up on the top would be the seating areas and barbecue areas throughout the site and grassy areas here. 
So um, again, it's a gated entrance and exit. Um, the fire department, the city's fire department and the public works department have reviewed the design of the gated access and have found it to comply with city standards. And this is a photo of um, the entrance, the primary entrance and exit of the site um, that would be from uh, Western Avenue. And then a, a section of um, showing how it would be developed with kind of a center median there. It's shown in this slide here. So it's, it's showing this area here with uh, some trees. So there are five different home styles associated with the subdivision. They're model homes, essentially. Um, all of the models are two-story homes, and they are all proposed with a Spanish-style architecture with varying earth tone shades and S-tile roofing. The window and door trim also has a variation in color, um, and those different color shades are, are shown on this slide. Plans one and two are a four-bedroom, three-and-a-half bath home um, they are each 2,609 square feet, or right around 2,600 square feet each, um, uh, 25 to 26 feet in height. Plan three is a three bedroom, two and a half bath, around 2,500 square feet in size. And then plans four and five are three bedroom, three and a half bath homes. Um, and they are around 2,500 square feet in size. And all of the homes are around 25 to 26 feet in height which is pretty standard for two-story home. This is an um, example of the exterior colors, roofing, and lighting that is proposed with the project. The roofing, ma roofing material is all an S-tile roof, but they do have some varying shades to um, just provide some visual interest and break up the uh, overall look of the home so that they don't look uh, too identical to each other. And then same with the... Um, the exterior shades of the homes as well. So this is an example of uh, the elevations of a lot that includes an ADU. And so the design of the home includes parking for the ADUs on the side yard of the lot. And it includes a carport, which is shown in this um, slide here. And so all of the ADUs would be detached, so in the rear of the, the home. And then, um, like I said, each one would have a carport. And the carports are um, essentially designed to be part of the home, so the, the architecture is compatible with the overall look of, the, of each of the home types. So for this example over here, this is the carport for the ADU. Um, there's also a two-car garage on every home. And, um, and then this is a side view of it. So this is the main residence with the ADU in the back. This is an a example of a lot that doesn't have an ADU. Um, it's pretty, a pretty standard um, lot for single family home. And it doesn't include any parking on the side yard. So this is an example of the um, lot layout that's for plan five. Um, there are nine lots within the subdivision that are not proposed to include an ADU. And um, this is one of the plans that would not include an ADU. It's 2,679 square feet in size and has a two car garage. So this is the lot layout for um, all the lots that would have an ADU. Um, again, all the homes are two stories with a front entry garage and they have two parking spaces provided within the garage. You can also have two spaces in the driveway and then an additional um, space for the ADU here and you could also have a tandem space behind. So you could have two spaces for the ADU. The um, project, the permit is conditioned to require that these spaces remain available at all times for vehicle parking and that no um, RV parking or non-offerable non vehicles or just storage in general can uh, be located here. And the same is true with the garage. There is a condition that requires the garage be made available for parking and um, 
the permit requires the applicant to submit a rental agreement to the city for review and approval before issuing a building permit to ensure that these uh, requirements are included in the rental agreement. So the applicant is asking for um, some modifications to development standards as a part of the plan development permit. And so I'll just walk through these uh, fairly quickly. Um, the first is they're asking for an eight foot reduction in the 10 foot side yard setback to allow for the ADU carport to extend into that area. So that's shown here. So essentially you have 10 feet and it would extend eight feet in. So you'd end up with a two foot setback, but that would only apply to the carport. Um, the rest of the area would remain open um, with the exception of the ADUs, which can go as close to four feet under the current state law. And then on corner lots, there's a, a, similar, a similar request for a two to nine foot reduction. And then for the front yard, they are, the applicant is asking for a um, six foot reduction in the 20 foot front yard setback. So that's where you see this 14 feet here. Um, they are asking that this reduction be granted um, to, uh, it, it basically brings the front of the house closer to the road. And then uh, you still have the garage set back at 20 feet and then there's still a 19 foot driveway that's available um, for parking of, of cars and trucks. And then they're asking for a 10% increase in the allowable paved area in the front yard. And that's again to provide paved area for the ADU parking, which is shown in this area. Um, in most lots you would see this landscaped, but because they wanna provide the parking for ADUs that, that would need to be uh, paved. And then finally, um, one of the corner lots, uh, lot 54, um, they're asking for a nine foot reduction in, there's a site triangle requirement that's 23 feet. So um, it's this area that's shown here. They're asking to allow the home to extend into this area. And we did have, um, Public Works Engineering review this request and they determined that it would not create a safety issue um, for traffic at all um, as a result of that. So the Planning Commission, in, in your permit, you do have findings to approve these modifications should you want to do so. Um, staff's recommendation is uh, that they be approved and that um, the modifications are otherwise consistent with the general plan, municipal code, and specific plan, and that um, they are needed for the project's design. Um, so I can go in further detail into the findings later if we need to, but um, that's uh, the recommendation at this time. So um, I wanted to mention some more uh, information about the amenities on the project. So this is the proposed community building and it's a Spanish mission style design that is compatible with the design of the single family homes. This is very similar to, or it's the same design that was presented at the study session that we had on the project last year. And this is the layout. So it includes a pool and a spa, a, a splash pad, and um, this is an area for a barbecue um, and sit seating area. And there's also an area for a, a tot lot for children. And then some community green space in the front. And then there's 10 parking spaces adjacent to the community center. The floor plan includes a fitness room or, and gym, a living room lounge area, some office space, a family study lounge, um, and that was added I think as a result of, of one of the study sessions that we had, um, they included a study area for um, families and then restrooms and there's an outdoor porch um, area for the pool. So landscaping for the project includes a mixture of landscaping types. The specific plan requires that it be primarily native and drought tolerant. And so the final landscaping plan um, will, you know, is required to include trees and 
shrubs and ground cover that meet the specific plan requirements. And that's a condition of approval in the permit. And all the landscaping has to be irrigated and designed in compliance with the municipal code as well. And then um, there are a number of street trees. I believe there's 110 street trees that would be included um, throughout the site. This is just the northern part of the property, um, but I just wanted to show this so that you get an idea of where the trees would be located. It's very similar on the south of, of the site as well. And then there's a few... Um, Roadway sections here, you can see where you have a tree on each side and then 24 foot wide roads and then the four foot wide sidewalks. So um, the staff's recommendation is that the Planning Commission by motion approve the plan development permit. And I, I did want to mention um, that there is a staff memorandum that is dated March 14th that was distributed um, yesterday and it has an updated set of conditions for both the plan development permit and the tract map. And so staff's recommendation is that um, you approve the plan development permit as conditioned in that staff memorandum. And same with the vesting tentative tract map, um, that it's approved per the conditions that are in that staff memo dated March 14th. We also received um, three comment letters on the project. All three letters were, um, are in support, and I'll just summarize them quickly. So there's a letter from the Home Builders Association that generally talks about the need for housing in Santa Maria and uh, the difficulty in, in currently finding housing. Um, there's a letter from Dignity Health that is also in support of the project that, again, talks about uh, the need for finding housing for the local workforce in the area and um, that's in proximity of the hospital. And then the last letter we received is from A.T. Still University and in support, and it talks about, uh, again, that finding housing is, is currently a challenge and that this housing would um, provide safe and affordable housing for students, faculty, and staff. So that concludes staff's presentation, and I'm available for questions. And the applicant is also here, and they do have a presentation. Uh, thank thank you. you, Dana. Uh, do we have any ex parte from the commissioners? Commissioner Lopez. Uh, yes, Mr. Seifert. I, uh, Chairman Seifert, I had a conversation with members of the development group this morning. Anyone else? I also had a conversation with the development group, but it was not this morning. Okay, let's move on. Um, are we ready for the applicant presentation? Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, my name is uh, Tamak Yamini. I'm with uh, Canfield Development. Um, we are a development company based out of uh, Southern California. Um, we're a fully integrated development company. We have a construction arm and a property management arm, and um, we uh, manage properties all over the Western United States. Uh, today, we're here to look at the Blossom Ranch project, uh, phase one, lots eight and 10. Um, Dana really did a wonderful job in the presentation, so I'm going to try my best to uh, skim through this presentation as quickly as possible so we don't double over. Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to all the planning staff and to all the staff at the Public Works Department, Parks and Rec, the City Manager's Office, and the, the City Attorney's Office who were really um, instrumental in, help, in helping us get this application um, completed and, and uh, giving uh, all, the, all the different details that are required for this application. So thank you guys. Um, let's see. Okay. So as uh, Dana mentioned, this is Area 5B, um, 160 acres uh, that is, bound, that is uh, bounded between Stowell Road, Blossom Road, um, Battles Road, and Depot Road. Um, last week, the City Council approved the recordation of the final map which subdivides the 160-acre lot into 12 individual lots, um, as well as the public improvement plan, which uh, paves the way for the future La Brea and Western Avenue, um, as well as uh, the Battles Channel, which is located right off of Battles Road between uh, Stowell, and, uh, sorry, between Blosser and Depot. Um, as Dana mentioned, uh, we, together with the city, management, city manager's office and the city attorney's office, we uh, entered into a memorandum of understanding for the uh, lot six, which is uh, dedicated towards uh, open space. And 
the memorandum of understanding essentially sets aside this parcel in lieu of Quimby fees, um, which basically means that there's no out-of-pocket cost to the city for the land. And this will be the home of the future sports complex, which we know is so important to the city. It's important to the neighborhood. It's important to the region. Uh, we're very excited about that, and we're, uh, we wanted to notify you guys about that. Additionally, we've agreed to transact in a timely manner so that we can meet the schedule required by the state uh, grant deadline that, um, that we know that the city uh, has to adhere to. Um, also, as part of the public infrastructure of our first phase, you'll see us construct the two driveway entrances, um, one off of uh, Battles Road at the bottom and at the top over there off of Stowell Road for the future sports complex. Uh, some of the other public amenities, Dana mentioned the, the two-acre fire station. Um, about nine months ago, under the leadership of, I believe it was Chief Tuggle, and now we've transitioned, but uh, from, under the leadership of Chief Tuggle, we, um, it was basically expressed to us the dire need of a fire station here at this site uh, to really shorten the response times the fire station has to deal with for this region. So um, we heard the need, and we've dedicated the two acres that was um, on our retail parcel, um, it's right there in red uh, on the bottom uh, right corner of the slide. And that's the exact location that the fire station requested. Um, obviously, there's going, to be need, there's going to need to be a, a zone change for that, but um, the city will be approaching uh, the commission shortly on that. Um, additionally, there's also a, uh, on lot five, it's zoned for a public facility, which the uh, Santa Maria Bonita School District has identified as a new school. Uh, we are currently in talks with them, um, and we will provide an update as soon as we have an update. So today we're here to discuss lots eight and 10. Lots eight and 10 is a uh, boundary between La Brea, Western, at the bottom at Battles, and um, one of the other lots, lot seven on the site. As part of our first phase of construction, um, the public infrastructure that will be built out will be the western half of La Brea, the southern half of Western Avenue, uh, the roundabout that's at the center of the site, lot 12, which is the stormwater basin, which will support uh, the development, the Battles Channel, which is uh, along Battles Road, uh, the walking trail on top of the Battles Channel. Um, there's also at the top the Stowell and Blosser intersection widening and pull relocations um, that will be done along with this first phase of the development. Um, we will also be upgrading the existing sewer line from a 15 inch to a 25 inch. Uh, there will also be three new traffic signals, one at the corner of La Brea and, ba and Blosser Road, uh, at the bottom at Battles and Western, and also the offsite uh, signal at Thornburg and Battles. So just a brief project overview. I know Dana kind of went through this already, um, but it's the first single family development for the Blossom Ranch Area 5B. Um, this community is currently uh, being uh, proposed as a for rent project, but we are presenting the map before you guys tonight um, to have that flexibility to transition this to a for sale product, um, should the market allow. Uh, the community is gonna consist of 106 lots, um, 105 main homes, uh, and one lot for the community center. 96 of those lots will include an ADU. Um, and as Dana mentioned, the, the ADUs um, are not required to be brought forward during a, a planning commission hearing, but in order to uh, create some consistency with the design standards, we presented them up front. Uh, this uh, community will be a professionally managed private gated community. It will include state-of-the-art amenity package, which I'll get to in a second, complimentary pocket parks and green spaces throughout the community. Uh, this community is also a green community, which will include solar, EV charging, and reduced GHG, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so to talk about the amenity package in a little more detail, it includes a clubhouse, which has a, a lounge and family area, a fitness center, children's study room, which was added at the direction of the planning commission, a business center, mail and package delivery center, a game room in the family room, a bike storage and repair center, and a sales, leasing, and management office, uh, all at this central location. Um, in the open space surrounding the clubhouse, uh, you'll see a pool, a spa, a children's splash pad, some barbecue, outdoor dining areas, a tot lot, as well as uh, some, some open green space in front of the community building with 10 parking spots uh, directly in front of the community building. Part of the amenity package you'll see uh, right to the uh, bottom part of the clubhouse is a gathering area just to create another additional space for families to enjoy. They want to throw you know, a birthday party, just another uh, a flexible area. That area will include some shaded structure, um, uh, some outdoor seating, and additionally, there'll also be a uh, outdoor library um, 
for the to you know to for the families to be able to use at their discretion. There's also a barbecue outdoor dining area located at the western area of the site, which includes uh, bar regular barbecue, Santa Maria barbecues, outdoor dining, outdoor seating, fire pits, etc. Uh, there'll also be a pet run located at the uh, eastern side of the site, um, which will uh, uh, be there for anyone, any residents that have pets. There's also a parking area directly adjacent to that pet area um, for guests. Community parking. Early on, uh, when we uh, decided to take a look at this project and really just see the feasibility, it was very clear, uh, talking to constituents and to the commissioners, that parking was a, a really large issue here. Um, so uh, we went ahead and provided the most parking that we believe that this city has ever seen on a private gated community. Um, there's a double car garage provided for every main home. There's two additional spots provided in the driveway for the main home. There's two tandem spots in the side yard for the accessory dwelling unit, and then a half a space per lot is provided as guest parking, evenly distributed throughout the site. Um, just to talk about the guest parking, uh, the guest parking, it, we really, you know, the, on the streets there is no parallel parking, but what we did was we calculated how many cars would have fit had we been able to provide the parallel parking on the roads and provided the exact amount of parking spaces, even more than that, that amount of parking spaces in direct access stalls uh, situated throughout the neighborhood. Um, because we have the additional driveway in front of the, the homes for the ADU, it provides very, very little area for tandem spots uh, for parallel parking on the streets. So this was just a, a, a fix to be, able to, um, to be able to accommodate the ADU parking. Um, because this is a professionally managed community, as Dana mentioned, part of the uh, conditions of approval is to enforce the parking requirements, making sure that actually the people that are parking in the, dri in the driveways and, the, and in the, in the uh, garages are actually the residents, and that the guest parking is, is actually set aside for guests. Um, additionally, we're providing EV charging stations at both every main home, every ADU, as well as uh, some throughout the guest parking stalls. This is really the future of where we're going with, um, with electrical uh, vehicles, and we saw that need and, and we're planning accordingly. So what ends up happening is that you have six parking spaces on each lot with an additional, a little more than a half a space per lot provided for guests. So it's 6.6 .6 spaces per lot, including the guest parking. Walkability. When we had uh, our study session back in April of 2022, um, there was some concern about walkability within this development. So what we added was, uh, initially when we came before you guys, there was about 50% of the frontage of the streets with walkways, and now you'll see 80% of the frontage of the streets uh, has a sidewalk in front of it, connections to the main, uh, to the main roads, connection to all the amenities, um, and, and, and you know, well-articulated sidewalks for safety. As, uh, as the pedestrians are walking through the neighborhood. Community safety was also a big concern. Um, that's one of the benefits of having a private gated community. This is an access controlled community. Um, there'll be security cameras throughout the, the neighborhood. Um, sp safe speed limits will be enforced. There's a network of walkways um, to create safe pedestrian um, uh, access to all the amenities. Well articulated crosswalks with differentiation of materials and colors. There'll be an abundance of sight lighting and because it's a professionally managed community, that will ensure the safety of the residents. Um, and they, you know, when you have an HOA on a, on a for sale product, um, this is most of the time their second job. And uh, when you have a professionally managed community that this is their entire job, it really creates a, a, a sense of security and safety for the residents. Landscape design. So um, as Dana mentioned, we have more than a street tree for every lot. Um, it's stylistically coordinated. Um, landscape design uh, for both the main entry and all the amenities to match the architecture. Um, there's pocket parks and gathering spaces. Um, there'll be uh, landscaping in the front yards, landscaping in the, in the rear yards. This is drought tolerant landscaping per the specific plan with a sustainable drip irrigation system to maintain uh, the water usage. This is just another aerial view of some of the pocket parks that Dana mentioned. Um, there are about four pocket parks that look like the two on the right-hand side, um, and then the entry gate landscaping that Dana already showed you guys. This is just a, an additional cross-section through the different uh, types of roads 
through the neighborhood. Um, yes, while we're not providing on-street parking, there are some, uh, there are the guest parking throughout the site. So um, this is not the same street width that you'll see on a local street, but it's the same roadway width as a local street, 24 feet, uh, with the additional parking spaces throughout the neighborhood. So now we'll get into the, um, the architectural uh, uh, theme of the, uh, of the community. So you'll see right here in front of you, in front of the fence, there are two, um, two boards with actual physical materials of some of, and colors of, of, of what the actual homes will look like. So as you're going through this, feel free to um, look at that and touch and feel uh, to be able to reference. Um, it's a Spanish architectural theme. We've provided five different um, model homes with five additional color themes and designs. So what you have is that uh, essentially every 25th home will actually be repeated on the site, um, having the same architecture and the same exact color scheme. This is just uh, the same slide that Dana showed um, that shows the five model homes with the five color schemes. And the five color schemes will in fact be interchanged between the model, the different models. So again, you'll have every 25th home that will be repeated. And um, I'll just mention that the specific plan allows for every fourth home to be repeated and that this is just um, uh, an effort to really create diversity within the community um, while still keeping that cohesive Spanish and Mediterranean theme. This is just a, a, a zoomed in version of that color material board um, that Carol, thank you Carol for walking around with that, um, uh, showed you guys. This is a typical lot layout. So um, what you'll see is the main home uh, on the right hand side over there with the two car garage, two car driveway. Uh, there's an entry porch, which again is part of the design of the specific plan. They were, they, it was requested that we put porches over there. And on the left hand side, you'll see that uh, the ADU parking. Um, I will point out that, yes, one of the modifications that we are asking for is for an 8-foot encroachment into the 10-foot uh, setback. That 10-foot setback is only, if you notice, at the top of the home where there's that little pop-out. It really ends up being only a 6-foot encroachment into the side yard um, where most of the carport is uh, on the bottom half adjacent to the garage. You can see that the home is set back a, a, little, a little further over there. Um, we have spacious kitchens. These are thoughtfully laid out neighborhoods and, and, and homes. Um, the, the privacy between the main home and the ADU uh, was designed for flexibility. If, if there would be two residents living um, in the ADU and, and the main home, so you can see that um, we have that little wall in the, in the yard that separates the main yard and the uh, patio for the ADU. We've also designed it so that no windows are facing each other. So as the ADU resident pulls in under that carport, there are no windows on that side of the, of the home. And as he walks towards the ADU, there are no uh, windows either from the ADU looking into the yard um, to create that level of privacy between the, the main home and the, and the accessory dwelling unit. Um, as mentioned earlier, there'll be EV, EV chargers installed. So we're not just preparing for the EV chargers, we're actually installing these EV chargers at every home and every ADU. Um, and there'll be solar on every home as well. So now to discuss the project modification. So I think we, we discussed the, the, the first modification, which is that encroachment into the 10-foot side yard setback. Um, again, I just want to reiterate that that this, was, uh, this, in, this addition to the project was specifically requested by the commissioners. Um, it, was a, it was a big concern that there wouldn't be parking for the ADUs. So adding the parking for the ADUs really is why these modifications are here in place. And I'll walk you through the first two modifications and how they've been affected. So the first one is the carport. Um, we provided the parking, but then it was requested that we make the carport for the ADU to provide some architectural interest and make it aesthetically pleasing uh, for the people walking in the neighborhood. So we've added this carport, it's attached to the main home, it matches the architecture of the main home, and that's why you, you have this first modification of that encroachment. Um, the second modification is a reduction of the 50% front yard landscaping requirement. Again, to provide for that uh, one driveway for the ADU, um, it's a, a 9%, I would say, a reduction in landscaping, the little chart on the side. And um, uh, again, that's there to provide the additional parking for the accessory dwelling unit um, uh, to ease the parking off of the community. Um, and then the last uh, modification is the Lot 54 site triangle. Um, as Dana mentioned, it makes the home the prominent feature per the specific plan. Um, one thing that's in the specific plan that I just want to bring to your attention is that the main home should be set back six feet from the, the front door of the, of the home. Uh, 
And another requirement is that the garage door should not be the predominant feature. So by adding these tower elements, which encroach the front yard, it creates some aesthetically pleasing and architecturally interesting uh, homes with that front yard encroachment. Um, and with that, I think I'm done my presentation. Oh, sorry, one more slide. Um, these are just some of the project changes since we've brought this to you guys in April of 2022. We've been through two study sessions, so I wanted to just make sure everyone remembers some of the changes that were done. Um, original project is not required to have ADU parking. We added the ADU parking. Um, it's not required to have a carport. For the ADU, we added that carport to match and improve the architecture. Uh, the driveway length, there was, a, there was an issue about whether there will be spillage onto the street uh, with a truck. So we've designed 20-foot driveways. This, this slide is a foot off, but 20-foot driveways to accommodate a Ford F-150 or something similar. Um, guest parking, initially there was 37 guest spaces proposed. Uh, we, we added an additional 20 spaces, and that makes it 57 guest spaces provided on the site. Uh, the home designs was a, was a big discussion. Um, we wanted to have a cohesive community with a white base home to match the Mediterranean architecture with some color accents. Um, but we heard the concerns from the commission and from planning staff and we created what you guys saw on the, on the boards over there, five base colors with multiple accents, trims and materials um, to really create every 25th home being repeated on the site. Uh, walkability, there was 55% of frontage with sidewalks when we initially proposed this project. There's now 80% of frontage with, wa uh, 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 with walkways on this project. And the addition of the children's study room, um, we believe it's a wonderful addition, especially since we believe families will live here. Um, so we, we, went, we went ahead and made, and made that addition as well. And with that, I'll open to any questions. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Commissioners? Commissioner Dickerson. Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, a couple of questions. I mean, I appreciate the, the, the effort you guys have gone into addressing our issues. Um, let me ask you a couple of things. Uh, the first is the, um, the uh, there's no, going to be no on-street parking, and that's the reason why you have all the additional parking on each lot. Is that correct? Uh, no, the additional, the, the, the no on-street parking is in lieu of the guest spaces. So the, the ADU parking is not required by code. That was just an additional concern that we heard from okay. constituents. All right. So, but uh, but in essence, that'll be part of the rental agreement, and um, that there will be no on-street parking. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And is that is that conditioned? Is that somewhere in here? I was looking for it, but I couldn't see it. I'm sorry. That's fine. I I believe you. There you go. Um, you had mentioned that this is, um, that you got a lot of rental, apart, um, a lot of rental properties throughout, throughout the West, I guess. Um, so is this the first of your, of the build to rent communities that you've so, done or have you, or, or have you managed others? So build for rent is a bunch of different types of products. One of them being townhomes and we definitely have townhomes as part of our, a part of our portfolio. I will mention that every state has a, not necessarily it's the same management company that we're using. We have our own management company that does California, and this is our first built for a community in California. Okay, and have you had a build to rent in uh, of this scale? Let's put it that way. Not and, of this scale. Okay, so this will be your first one because I'm a little concerned because, as you say, this is going to be professionally managed, but it sounds like we're the guinea pig. Oh, no, no. The management company for this project will be Graystar, which is one of the largest uh, management co property management companies in the United States. And they have an immense amount of experience in built for communities that are larger than this. I probably should have mentioned that. So this built for community here in Santa Maria will be managed uh, by the company that does built for specifically around the, United, the entire United States. Do you happen to have the, the average increase in rent that takes place from the point that you start that 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 company manages starts managing their properties to to current. I mean, do you do you happen to know that? Because I honestly, one of the things that has me enormously concerned for bringing this into uh, into our community is that this industry is really well known for bringing this in, having a certain rent and then starting to edge the prices up, which then it becomes a tail wagging the dog situation where the, re the other rent rentals throughout the city 
start seeing that these prices can be raised and they start raising all of theirs and it becomes this snowballing effect. If not just this project, but if the whole, the whole th the thing as a whole goes through, you guys will control 5% of our entire rental um, uh, inventory. And if you start raising prices, it is going to wash across everything. And I know that we had these letters that have come out saying, you know, we really need additional housing for this staff and this staff. But I wonder if they've ever given any consideration to the rental creep that might take place from your management company. Yeah, I mean, every, every community is dictated by the local market. And um, I can't speak to how frequently there's increases in rent. Um, I will say, though, that uh, by adding this neighborhood, it takes a substantial uh, burden off of the other communities as well, creating a more competitive market. So adding more housing, in fact, is, is, is good in general to easing the burden and easing the rents in the other neighborhoods. Um, because there is no, nothing like it here in Santa Maria, it's very hard to dictate uh, what, what the rents will be because there are no ho housing for rent communities currently. Um, but what I can say, um, especially with today's market, is that a family looking to buy a home um, in Santa Maria, specifically with today's interest rates, um, including property taxes and insurance um, and down payment, is going to be paying about 40% more to uh, in, a, in a monthly mortgage to live in a home versus over here, if they wanted to try out a home first, they can live in a four-bedroom home with three bathrooms, and they're paying you know 60% less. Than, it, than what they would have to do if they were in a, uh, in a in, if they were paying a mortgage every month. Forty percent less. Forty, sorry, forty percent less. Mm -hmm. Math is not my strong point either. That's all right, but but I, but I find that, I, you said that you, it's it's very difficult to decide to think about what the rent is going to be because of the this and that, but the reality is you've penciled it out. It would be insane to think that you have not penciled it out. <laughs> So you, you, you must know roughly what you're going to be charging in the first year, second year, maybe as it amortizes out over year five and ten. Yeah, Kurt, that's correct. Um, I, I think that what we have to go off of is, is three-bedroom apartments. That's our closest that we have here. And we're just within a couple hundred bucks of renting a, a, th a three-bedroom apartment. That's where we've underwritten um, the rents today because that's what we have available on the market. Okay. So you haven't done any studies or you haven't... Uh... Oh, we have oh, something. So you have. So of course. So yeah. what would you say the rent is? There what the rent increase is going to be? Let's say in year five. So no, because we have such a large site and because it's being built out over ten years. So there's a lot of um, a lot. There's going to be a lot of move-ins over the first ten years. So it's not necessarily year five. Um, the way our underwriting is today is to off based off of today's current market conditions. Um, we do the same thing with our construction costs. Our construction costs are using today's market conditions because um, that's all we—that's all the data we have. So a lot of it is based off of you know how much do we pay for the home versus how much you know we need to cover ourselves. And really, there's a standard industry standard of, of how much we need in order to make a project viable, and that's what we follow. Um, so the way we underwrite it today is today's rents with today's costs. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for you. Are you currently in contract with Graystar? They they do a bunch of other our other sites. We're not in contract with them on this site quite yet, but on a bunch of other of, of our apartment complexes, um, they are our uh, management company. Okay. Um, uh, Heather, I have a question. Uh, Grace, uh, Graystar is a client of mine. Current client. Would it be a conflict for me on this project? Um, possibly. I mean, if they're going to be the management company that's going to take this over, and uh, I would, you know, at a, a huge uh, financial benefit to them and their client of yours, I, I mean, they, we would have to do an analysis of that, you know, under the Political Reform Act. It depends on what the increase to their profits are. There's the whole mathematical analysis that I could not do on the spot this evening. Um, if you have any doubt, you may want to uh, recuse yourself from the uh, decision. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I will recuse myself. Thank you, Commissioner Lopez. Sorry. 
Commissioners? Commissioner uh, Mahasher? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to revisit the ADU. It did have a separate yard, correct, from the main home? I'm sorry, repeat the question? The ADU, it has a separate yard from the main home? Correct, yeah. And the division of that yard, how high is that? It's a five to six foot um, fence with landscaping on either side. Okay, and then um, I was looking at the different themes of the home, and of the homes provided, and the ADU, it was hard to tell. Not all of them had covered parking spots. Some of them did. Is that dependent on the, the theme chosen? Yeah, it's a, every theme is going to be a little different, but the ADU and the carport will match the theme of that specific lot. Okay. And then my last question regards to the guest parking. Um, there was charging stations there as well. Correct, yeah. And how many um, charging stations are there that take away from the regular parking? There's about half of the guest parking spaces will have uh, EV charging capabilities. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Blanco. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think this might be a question for staff. Um, as I was reading the specific plan, I noticed side yard setback requirements for corner lots at 19 feet. Is that correct? Because I don't see that the plan meets those setbacks, and I don't see an exception for that. So I just I want to make sure I was reading that correctly in the specific plan. And if so, then I think that might be an issue with the layout. Commissioner um, uh, Blanco, I can check that. Um, I went off the application, the applicant's request in their most recent submittal for modifications. And um, oh. there is one modification to corner um, lots, and it's a two foot to nine foot reduction in the side yard setback. So that may be uh, what what covers it? I didn't have a slide because it varies depending on the lot, but there are a number of lots. Um, and there, I think they're mentioned in the staff report. Actually, there's a number of lots that would have a side yard reduction that some as little as two feet, and then others are gr as great as nine feet. So, if that's what you're referring to, I, I believe it is included in um, the modifications. Well, I'm not. Totally clear, but from what I could tell, um, just my reading online of our specific plan, it says on a corner lot, the setback shall be 19 feet from the side property line adjoining the street. The other side shall be less than, shall be no less than five feet. Garages with access from the side street should not be closer than 18 feet from the back of sidewalk. So, you know, again, that was just on my reading that I did yesterday to, to take a look at that. And I, it didn't look like we had 19 feet you know, on the corner lots, so I, I would, <clears throat> I, that's something I would want to take a look at. Obviously, that's that's pretty big reduction, because I don't think there's anything even remotely close to 19. That's a big, that's a good size setback. Yeah, uh, if there's other questions, I can try to bring up the plans, project plans, and we can look at that. Okay, and then also, uh, in addition, you know, the, the number of exceptions that we have is a is significantly high than we're accustomed to. You normally will be entertaining one or two exceptions on one or two lots, but have we ever entertained this many exceptions on this many lots? It just seems unusual. I mean, you're, you're, I mean, it's, it, it doesn't seem like any undue hardship here. It, there's, I don't see a, I don't see a reason for it, or you know a good justification for so many setback exceptions. And I just don't understand. I don't think that that's typical. I don't think we've seen that, at least not on my tenure here, that many exceptions. Is that, is that correct? We don't normally have that many, right? Well, since I've been here, I have not seen a project with this many modifications um, to development standards. But there is a process under a plan development permit where applicants can request it. I think the trade-off on this project is that they do provide a fairly extensive amount of um, amenities that are not typical for a single family residential subdivision, like the 4,000 square foot community building with the pool and the spa. And, you know, they have multiple open space areas, tot lots, seating areas all throughout. Uh, the specific plan does require tot lots and um, pocket parks. So that's consistent, but the specific plan doesn't require more than that. Like the community building is not a requirement under the specific plan. Um, and then the applicant has agreed to convey the um, park land as well to the city to allow the city to develop that, um, the regional sports complex. So 
Um, I think that that's one of the reasons, the main reasons why the city um, is recommending approval of the modifications. Also, the, um, the ADU parking is important. Um, the state does not require that they provide parking for ADUs. Um, this site is within a half mile walking distance of a bus stop. And so as a result, ADU parking is not required, uh, but they do have it uh, included in the project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Do you have an additional question? Okay. Um, I, I, I do like to thank you for listening to uh, all of the um, items uh, that we talked about in study session. You've made uh, considerable changes to the project since we first saw, saw it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy with those. Uh, as, as far as the, uh, the line of sight and the setbacks, uh, uh, to me, that would be uh, a condition for speed, uh, for, uh, uh, depending on what your speed limit is, uh, because it, it's actually to keep you from running into other people or kids, or I mean, it's, it's a safety thing. So uh, our speed limit here is like 15 or 20 miles an hour? Correct. Yeah, and, and you have on-site management, and so there's going to be people watching that and enforcing it. Uh, so, so as far as the line of sight on this one, it, it's not um, hugely important to me. Um, the, uh, the carports uh, for, the, uh, for the ADU's encroachment, now that's generally a, uh, I don't see a f anyone from fire here, but that's generally a fire requirement, isn't that correct, Mark? Chair Siebert, I believe so. Yeah, it's, it, and, and I, I think we have a minimum of five feet. So, so actually, you've got some numbers up there, but I, I believe we're ending up at three feet away from property line. Correct. And you have a uh, structure that's made out of concrete tile. Um, it's a mixture of stucco and um, and wood framing. Um, it, but the but the roof is a is a tile roof, correct? Correct. Yeah, so f f fairly non-flammable. Uh, uh, materials, and, and I believe that's why we have those uh, requirements in place, is for one fire on, a, on one lot not to be able to transmit to another. Um, so we, we've got the right materials there, and we're really not uh, encroaching quite as much as what you're saying. I think the minimum is five feet, so we're, we're within two feet of that. Um, I don't see that as a huge problem. I'm seeing this more as a, uh, more like you're saying, uh, the only thing I can compare to is a townhome project where uh, it's going to be run by the owners, uh, and it's going to be gate guarded, and it's going to be a, a private community. Uh, so, uh, as, when you get into those type of things, the the traffic slows down. The, the there's a lot of differences as far as if it's public streets. So, I think you're going to have a lot of control over that. Uh, I, I, I I didn't see that as a huge problem. Um, you said you've got a lot of uh, electrical out there. How are you heating the units? What, what, are you bringing any gas at all into these units, or is this going to be an all-electric? So um, we're currently going through the plans right now with PG&E and SoCal Gas, but we are bringing gas to the infrastructure on LeBran Western, um, but we've also um, uh, calculated the electrical capacity should the codes change in the future, so we're preparing for both scenarios. Okay. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a proponent of gas, but, uh, uh, but these days... Yeah, it seems like a lot of people don't like it anymore. Um, uh, I didn't understand the La Brea exiting. Can we, what, 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 did you say it was an exit only or what was it? Exit that? only. Can, yeah. can I see that on the site map? I didn't, I didn't catch that quite. So this, this is the exit only out to La Brea, and this is the entrance and exit out to Western. Um, we did have these entrances and exits reviewed by the fire department for emergency access because um, obviously 
you know, there's going to be a lot of people living here using these driveways. And so that was a concern that staff had. And so we did have the fire department review this. They've approved the access. Um, and public works engineering has reviewed it as well because the city has specific standards for gated access. Like there's setbacks and um, you have to have extra room, you know, if there's two vehicles that drive in or something to get in through the gate. So, so the uh, so so it's an exit only on. So, can you make a left turn on the braille? Is it is it left right or uh, what? What are we talking about there, Mark? Yeah, uh, Tracy. For it, to my understanding, it wouldn't be controlled. It'd be left or right. Either. Okay. But but there's no signal anything on that particular. No signal street. stop. It would be stop control only if you're on the property. And there's a gate there. That's an exit gate right there. Correct. All right. All right. Interesting enough. Okay. Um, I, I, I like the idea of the sports park, uh, but I also know that there's some uh, very high voltage transmission lines that run right over that, uh, which gives me a little bit of pause, but uh, there's not much we can do about it. Uh, the people only be there, they're not living underneath those lines, they're only playing under them, so I don't think the EMTs are too, too powerful, uh, but they are very high transmission lines. They are, they are high. Uh, but there's some of the main transitions lines that come into the city. It's not just your normal uh, 24K or something. Um, I think that's it, uh, it for my questions there. Um, I think that's it from the commission. Okay. And Chair Seifert, I wanted to go back to Commissioner uh, Blanco's question about the corner lots. So the plans, um, I was in the process of trying to bring them up, but then we brought this up. So I can speak to it though. It's sheet um, A0.11 of the plans, and it does depict the corner lots, and it shows the required 10 foot side setback, which the project would meet. But um, they are asking for a modification to the 19 foot side yard setback, and the plans are indicating that it would be about a 16% encroachment into that side yard for the main area of the home. So they're uh, requesting a 10 foot setback maximum mm -hmm. or minimum. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, but the 19 is the, the requirement. Excuse me? The, the 19 is the requirement. Yes. They're asking for 10 foot. Yes. So and it's a, shown on the plans it, that they, um, they have here. And I'm sorry I can't bring it up. But didn't That's okay. have that available. I, mean, I, I just, I happened to notice that. It didn't look like they had 19. I wasn't clear if 19 was the standard requirement, but it looks like it is. Yes. So that's not, that's, it looks like maybe all of their corner lots have that. Yeah. They okay. call out, uh, and it, I have it in the project, uh, the staff report, that there's all, basically all the corner lots, they're asking for this modification. Um, okay. I will point out that the modification is not all, not 10 feet for every lot. They range from nine feet to two feet, so certain corner lots are only asking for a two foot encroachment into the side yard. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want a clarification as to why La Brea was exit only and not entrance as well. Was there, what was the determining factor? Um, it just, uh, you don't, it's not required by code to have a secondary entrance. Okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. Um, I believe that does it for us. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, at this time, I'm going to uh, open it up to the public. I do have a written request. Do we have, uh, is there an order on this, Dana? Do I go written or Zoom or how do you want to do it? Um, I, it's up to you. I mean, we could start in the room and then see if we have anyone on Zoom. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, well, if he stayed, if yes, if he's still there, yes, exactly. Uh, so at this time, uh, let's, is there anyone in the room that would like to speak on this? Is that what we're doing? Public comment? We got the slips? Okay. Okay, we're going to give three minutes to each, uh, each uh, person, and we're going to start with uh, Daniel Rinksmeyer, followed by Linda Hatcher, Lindy Hatcher. followed by Glenn Morris, followed by Rebecca Velasquez. Daniel, please state your name and Mr. address for the record. My name is Dan Rinksmeyer, and my address is 5975 Oak Hill Drive in Santa Maria. 
Um, I just wanted to voice my support for this project. Uh, I think the, the lack of housing and what this is going to bring to the business community is going to make people pretty happy because it's been difficult the past few years to hire people, bring them into this area and find housing for them. And uh, I think this housing, I know there's a lot of planning that goes into this, but it just looks like a very high quality development to me. Um, the fact that you've got that sports complex going in, um, I've had the opportunity the last couple of years to uh, uh, take my granddaughter to the soccer games across the street, and I can tell you by being there, uh, I was just amazed at uh, the energy over there. All those fields are busy. Those tables are full of people with barbecues and picnics. There's mariachi bands. I mean, the energy there is just uh, unbelievable. And I think you're going to have the very same thing happen right across the street. And um, those kind of facilities are really needed in this, in this town. So um, I would just tell you, I hope you can support it and uh, go forward with it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Please state your name and address for the record. Yeah, Good three evening. Minutes. I'm Lindy Hatcher. I'm the executive director of the Home Builders Association of the Central Coast, and I'm from San Luis Obispo, and I cover San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties at work. So what I would like to say is the HBACC supports projects like this. Uh, we're excited to see the Blosser Ranch project, and we believe that uh, this development has some benefits to the city of Santa Maria and its residents. Um, it increases the needed housing supply. Currently, we have a housing supply and demand problem, and that's helping exasperate a housing crisis. Fewer houses are available for rent and purchase, which drives up prices, and um, we see this as creating more supply and being part of the solution and driving down housing prices uh, and rentals prices. Uh, major employers all agree that housing is their number one challenge to attracting, uh, hiring, and retaining employees. Uh, while we recognize not all employees are going to qualify for affordable housing, this project also has some comp components of um, affordable housing in it. And this project comes with roads and sidewalks and drainage and, and other infrastructure, like we mentioned, the sports complex, fire um, station land being donated, and we're um, also understanding new schools, and um, I heard traffic signals and, and a lot more going in for infrastructure for the city. Uh, it fills a standing community need for the sports complex for youth sports locations with the 19-acre complex. And being that it's in exchange for Quimby fees, there's no out-of-pocket outlay from the city for the land for that park. Uh, this project location uh, provides easy access to restaurants, to um, shopping and services in the area, and also um, on-ramps to 101. Um, it includes on-site amenities, I was kind of drooling over the pool and the workout room and all these uh, amenities added to this project that also lets people recreate and stay home and do some of the things that they would normally travel to do. Uh, while this land um, is uh, projected to generate additional tax for the city to help offset some of the expenses for the public services, such as schools, parks, emergency responders, et cetera. Uh, we just see housing as crucial for economic development. And we ask you to approve this project with portions of workforce and affordable housing to help ease our current housing crisis and prepare. The struggle is real for employers trying to hire. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Please state your name and your address, Mr. Morris. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, Glenn Morris with the Chamber of Commerce at 614 South Broadway. Uh, so I want to I want to make this uh, I want to take a conversation we hear regularly and make it local. Um, so I think you know you've heard as as these new product types have come into the community conversation that you know. You know 
not everybody will want to live in that particular kind of housing, but somebody will, right? The, you know, the new generation, somebody's going to want uh, to that, that type of product. Let me share four specific customer types that I see demand for today in our community for this product. Uh, one, I think the applicant mentioned, you know, the opportunity for somebody who's moving up, right? Maybe they've been in an apartment, their family has grown, uh, they're, they're ready for a home, but maybe they don't have a down payment yet. And this could be that bridge kind of, a, of an opportunity to give them, um, you know, more of, a, of a, an individual family living environment um, as, they, as they work toward uh, moving up the housing um, ladder. Um, Second one would be the, the scenario that my family and I were in when we moved to the community nine years ago. Um, we weren't ready at that time. We didn't know the community well enough. And we weren't really ready to commit to a particular neighborhood. Um, but we also knew um, I had two young adult kid, you know, members of my family living with me in a standard apartment just wasn't going to work. Um, so we were looking to rent a home. We were fortunate to find a private rental um, that we lived in for a, a number of years uh, before really get learning the community and, and choosing a neighborhood in which we bought a home. Uh, third uh, group would be this, this morning, um, I was out at Vandenberg Space Force Base having a conversation with a number of their senior leaders, and, and they were talking about um, known growth um, out there today um, over the next five to six years is about 500 military um, or civilian direct employees of the base, right? So that represents potentially 500 families. Not all of them are going to live in Santa Maria, but a significant number of them we know will choose to come into Santa Maria. Uh, those are, they, they, they're generally going to have families, um, but they're only going to be in the community for three to five years. Does it make sense for them to make the investment in purchasing a home, or would they prefer to live in a single family residence that they can rent uh, for that period of time that they're there? Um, and then the third, you've heard a, you heard a mention about Marion. Um, and I don't want to put words specifically in their mouth or other large employers. Let me think about things like school districts, uh, maybe the city, uh, larger employers who are struggling to bring people into the community. Imagine a scenario where Marion, I'm going to use them as an example uh, because they're well known. Let's say Marion entered into a contract with these folks to control 15 units. Right, that they could use when they need to surge their staffing with traveling nurses or they're recruiting a new doctor who, again, needs a bit of time before he settles into his practice and understands where he wants to make his home. Right? And that scenario could exist in a number of employment models. Um, you, know, you hear all the time in communities about you know, school teachers, um, city employees, police officers struggling as they move into communities to find housing. And it's often not the case that they can't afford the housing, it's that the housing that they're looking for isn't available. And often that means single family homes. I think for me the bottom line on this kind of a thing is as our community grows, we're going to continue to find a wider diversity of residents who have different preferences, different needs and wants than maybe what our generation and those of us that already live here um, expect and are used to, right? And I think a successful community is one that will ensure that the broadest range of inventory product um, is available. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Our last speaker, Rebecca Velasquez. Hi, good night. Uh, good evening. Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Rebecca Velasquez. My address is 1343 West Beacon Way. Um, I live like pretty much right across the street on the other end of Blosser, or on the other side of Blosser. Um, I'm really happy to have this area built up because it's residential houses on my side of Blosser, on all surrounding edges. Um, and it'd be all nice to have um, just safer, you know, neighborhood right there and also like new sidewalks. There's no sidewalks surrounding. Um, so I'm a mom. I could take my kids on a walk, on a bike ride to the open space. I know a lot of other parents that would be really excited about that. Um, also, my middle child is a wheelchair user. So to have a new park means to have an accessible park. And I will always promote an accessible park. Um, we don't have any accessible parks we can walk to right now. We have to drive about like seven minutes to get to one. Um, so that would be amazing. And um, 
Yeah, the, um, also the part of the development that's all energy efficient as a millennial, um, that's very important to me, um, important to like all the other parents I know. Um, so um, yeah, so very much in support. <laughs> um, that's it for me. Well, thank you very, very okay. much for coming out. Appreciate it. Uh, that's the last of our speaker slips. And Zoom? Yes, we have one speaker on Zoom. Perfect, thank you. You guys take it over from here. All right, the speaker on the phone has been unmuted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Felix Esparza. I am a retired city employee working for the police department for 25 years. In the last, uh, I've been retired for about 10 years. In those last 10 years, I've been involved in nonprofits and also throughout my contacts in those uh, meetings and nonprofits and, and some jobs that I've had part times I've met some high scale employers in the community and uh, down to small business owners. And it seems like the common theme and concern is what we've been talking about, at least some of our speakers have, and that is accessible housing, affordable housing, um, and uh, this project, uh, this uh, Blossom Ranch project fits that need and perfectly provides that opportunity for future owners. And as it has been said, maybe not everybody would want to live there, but someone will live there and someone needs to live there. And uh, with the idea of the sport complex, and as a retired police officer, I, I have emphasized for 30 plus years in this community that we need more activities, more places for you to uh, provide them with uh, positive alternatives, with more of sports, with more activities. So this provides that need, that 19-acre sports complex is a perfect fit for that. In addition to that affordability, the Blossom Ranch includes many affordable housing units, which will provide housing options for low-income families and individuals. For those seeking smaller footprint, Blossom Ranch will offer the average casitas with about 700 square feet of living space. The job creation is a plus for this project. The development will create jobs during the construction phase and provide employment opportunities for residents as the project is completed, including a mix of commercial and residential uses. The improved infrastructure, the development includes New roads, new sidewalks, drainage basin, this is again the sports complex, a fire station, and the new school. Plus additional infrastructure improvements that will benefit the entire community. Overall, the Boss Ranch development can provide significant benefits to the Santa Maria community, including increased housing supply, job creation, community amenities, and environmental sustainability. It is time for us, both as residents and as elected leaders, to take action. We cannot afford to wait any longer to address the housing crisis. We need to act now. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Thank you very much, sir. Is there anyone else on the Zoom? Uh, no other hands are raised. Okay, I've got a couple more uh, speaker slips. Uh, we've got uh, Heather Gray, please uh, come up to the podium, state your name and address for the record. Hello, my name's Heather Gray. I'm the president of a Santa Maria-based electrical engineering firm, Gray Electrical Consulting and Engineering. We're located at 2529 Professional Parkway here in Santa Maria. I founded my company in 2012 and we've been happy to operate our company in the city for about 10 years now. Um, at GECE, we're committed to providing exceptional electrical engineering services to our clients, and with years of industry experience, we've built a reputation for excellence and professionalism, which we are proud of. And we recognize the importance of sustainability in our work. As we are responsible, uh, as we are a responsible engineering firm, we strive to create electrical systems that are energy efficient, environmentally friendly, and do so while forging collaborative relationships with our local utility providers. When Canfield Development came to GECE uh, to support their electrical design and, um, facility infrastructure uh, coordination with the utility company, they put their trust in a local firm um, 
And we, through working with them, we realized the, that they also value the importance of quality electrical design as it is a crucial impact to our community. And the electrical design for this project features a variety of sustainable design elements such as highly efficient lighting systems, advanced lighting control systems, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and renewable energy sources. All of these design measures are progressive, code compliant, and within the best practices within our industry. Further, in support of this project, GECE has engaged with our local utility providers to ensure that all infrastructure is upgraded to sustain the capacity needed for the development. And collaborating with them, we've also been able to revitalize the electric utility facilities present along the frontage of the project at Stoll and Blosser, which not only undergrounds um, existing aerial facilities, but it also improves and revitalizes all of the facilities that benefit the greater residential and business business areas um, that are served from that distribution. Uh, Canfield recognizes the crucial role that electrical systems play in promoting environmental benefits and neighborhood revitalization efforts. And pursuant to this, we value them very much as a client and support this project. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Weintraub, state your name and address. Well, you already have, but do it again, please. Hi, Jacob Weintraub, 1643 South Bradley. Uh, I wasn't planning to speak tonight on this uh, agenda item, but I felt compelled by seeing the presentation. Um, I think Canfield has done a great job with this project. I was really impressed by uh, their response to the, the requests from the Planning Commission uh, mm -hmm. during the study session and how they responded to your requests. Um, I'm very impressed by the the donation of the fire station property, uh, the dedication to the school property, the signals, the park, the playing fields. Uh, I like the design of the off street, street parking. I think it's gonna be nice to be able to drive down the street and not have a bunch of cars parked on the street. Uh, I think it will look very nice to have all the, all the cars parked not on the street. Um, I know the owners that I work with have many employees that will appreciate this product because um, as you start off in uh, your professional life, it's very hard to uh, save for a down payment to purchase a, a home. And so to be able to uh, have more rental product uh, here in Santa Maria, I think will be great for the city. Um, Canfield came to Santa Maria and they've hired a great team. A lot of professionals here, here that are top notch. And I think they are not bringing in outside consultants um, that don't know the area. I think that the team they've uh, assembled uh, with Hawkhauser Blatter and everyone else has, has been, are, are gonna uh, really uh, design a great product. And so they're not just a firm from LA that come and, and uh, blow and go. I think that they're here uh, and they're really dedicated to the city to, uh, to have a great product. So I support this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you guys like to speak again as a rebuttal? Uh, Lori Tamora, um, thank you very much. In, in closing, we've worked hard on this project um, to bring forth uh, a diversity of housing types, very well designed um, with the team that we have here, and um, we are um, consistent with most of the requirements of the ordinance and the specific plan. We have identified the modifications to accommodate the ADUs and the parking on each one of the lots to um, make sure that we don't have some of the spillover parking problems that other neighborhoods have. Um, we're here tonight requesting your approval of the project and we're available for any questions that you might have in closing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Commissioner? Uh, were were, uh, were questions to, of the public or applicant from the commission? Nope, okay. At this time, I'm gonna close a public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Uh, we'd like to have a discussion. Commissioner Dickerson. 
Um, I uh, I have a problem with this with with this project, but but first let me say that by and large, I actually really like this project. I mean, if you if it was just isolated by itself, this is a you guys have just done a really nice job. You've you've, you've interacted with us with with the the community and you've uh, produced a lot of, of good things and you've altered things and I appreciate it tremendously. So it's gonna be a little bit of a downer for you guys to hear now, the other shoe. Um, for, first of all, um, the uh, bring up what uh, Commissioner uh, Blanco uh, had to say about, uh, about all of the uh, alterations that are being asked for. I, I think in many of those cases they were their modifications based on what we asked of them. So they wanted, we wanted parking off the street, we wanted it on the side. They, they, they found a way to accommodate our desires. And of course, that's gonna wash across the entire, the entire project because it's the vast majority of the, of the lots. You know, it's 90, what, 96 out of the 104 or something. So, I mean, uh, it, it's the vast majority. So here, here's my here's my my issue, and I and I and I did bring it up, and that is that I am I'm very concerned about this industry, the the, the build for rent industry, and it, its introduction into our community, um, and and for me, what I I I've already stated that I I like this project isolated unto itself, but I am concerned about how. It, once you have the full build out of this uh, of this uh, this land and this and the ideal of the project, I am very concerned about the intended or unintended consequences of what is going to do to the remaining to to the rest of our rental um, inventory over the next five or ten years. Um, so. You know, part of the things that, that we as a, as a body oftentimes lose sight of, and that is the potential of unintended consequences. And I am very concerned that by looking at this as just an entity isolated unto itself, that somehow we may be impacting in a negative way. I mean, obviously, if it was a positive way, that would be wonderful. But in a, in a negative way, the remainder of the community of, of Santa Maria. Um, for me, I wouldn't be able to vote for this project tonight. Now, what what I would like to see, what I would, would hope to be able to get something from in the future, if we could continue this, is something from staff that has looked at other communities that this industry has gone into and gotten some sense of how, and, and like sizes, like, you know, I mean, as I said, if you, if you built this whole thing out, you know, you'd be, you'd be impacting, you'd be controlling about one, one renter, one landlord would be controlling about 5% of the popula of the rental population. That's a lot. That's an awful lot. And what I'd be curious to know is in, in other communities, when you have an impact like that, and do they start edging up the rents? Do they start edging up the rents, which then washes over to the rest of the community? And what seems like a really good thing at the time ultimately ends up being something that all tenants pay for down the road. All the amenities, that this community gets, if, if it, you're looking at an increase in rents, then all, everybody's paying for that. And, and the only people who are getting the, the benefit are the people living in that. So that's where I come from on it. I, I would just like more information. I'd like more information about this type of industry because if, if we approve this industry, if we approve this project, we're basically approving Things down the road, and it might ha have other, you know, other developers who look at this model and start coming from out of 
out of the area. And all of a sudden, maybe we even have a bigger percentage of the inventory that is being managed by a limited number of landlords. And that's my concern. Thank you. Commissioners, Commissioner Blanco. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start with a similar uh, tone that Commissioner Dickerson had. I, I, I'm impressed, really, with the amount of work that's gone into the plans. I mean, that's a lot of detail. I can certainly appreciate it because I've, I've had to do it myself. I, I, I do similar work, so I, I can appreciate the amount of detail, and I think um, the amount of work that went into it and, and thought. Um, <clears throat> I, I have more of a concern with the, the overall approach to the design because as I read the specific plan, I find a lot of areas where we're really not meeting that. And so, you know, and I've said it from day one, we've got a specific plan for a reason. We want this to be a very specific design and we want this to be a very cohesive uh, and, and, and have a plan up front that dictates how the development's going to go. And I think I, I just don't feel like it's, it's meeting that intent. And, and I really look at the purpose, really forget about the, the setbacks and the math and the everything. When I read the purpose for, for this area, you know, straight from the specific plan for PDR1, and, I'll, and I'll, just, I'll just read it aloud for everybody. It says, the PDR1 designation is intended to establish and maintain a traditional single family theme for the planning area and promote a suitable environment for single family living on a scale representative of a traditional neighborhood by developing lots with special residential design and yard requirements, while at the same time maintaining adequate individual private open space. And I really don't see this lot layout and these, the, the design really meeting these components. And so if that's at the forefront purpose, um, we're not hitting the purpose. And so I, I, I'm in favor of the concept. I think, I think providing additional housing in Santa Maria is obviously a huge priority, but I think we've got to approach it the right way and if we're just going to I think I'm not saying ignore but if we're not going to focus on the specific plan and meeting it then why do we have a specific plan I think there's a reason we prepared it and I think we need to honor it and I, I have a hard time seeing that being met um, you know in addition to the setbacks and the fact that I asked the question that I, I don't think we've ever had that many setback um, exceptions I think you know, it's usually one or two lots that we're evaluating and, and it's really kind of a, a hardship situation. I don't really see a hardship here. We don't have physical constraints next to buildings that we can't buy or uh, encroach into wetlands or anything like that. So I just, other than maximizing, which I can understand the desire to do, other than that, I don't see a justification for some of these exceptions. Um, you know, I, like I said, I do appreciate some of the amenities. I, I have a hard, I mean, the, I understand that density is less than the eight DUs per acre, but in effect, it's really more than that. The effective density is gonna be double with all of the ADUs. We can't do anything about ADUs, but effectively it will be double and the impacts will be felt uh, in the community and the rest of the public. So um, I like, I like, the, I like the product, I like the idea. I'm not a big fan of the rental situation. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of optimistic to hear that there's some flexibility that those lots could be sold off for ownership. That I think is kind of a dicey situation too and how you're gonna manage partial rentals and partial ownership and all the common space. So I, I, I think that's gonna be a pretty messy situation in the future. So that, that'll be interesting. But, I, I, at the very top, I think it's the purpose that's not really being met. And I think a redesign could potentially address that, but what we got right now doesn't meet um, the specific plan the way I see it. So that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Rahajer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually, I do like the concept of this project a lot. I do think that there is a need for our local employers to provide housing for their employees coming here at a fixed 
contract of employment for a certain amount of years. I don't want to commit to a whole um, home here. Um, however, and this might be pretty nitpicky, but the the one exit on La Brea, I feel like that's a little inconvenient for the people that will be residing there. Um, and I do have some concerns um, regarding the the rental market, and I'm not sure what that looks like um, in terms of affordability, understanding that there's going to be, you know, competing prices with the other apartment complexes. But um, other than that, I, I do think we do have a need for this type of development in the city. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, that's an interesting project, and it brings a lot of emotions to us and different concepts. It's not something that we've seen before or we've experienced in our town. But what we have experienced is public meetings. And generally, when we get these many slips, they're all no. And there's people in the audience tonight that uh, I, I see out there, and they're all in favor of this project. That is unusual to me. Normally, we get a lot of complaints. We get people showing up because, out of their comfort zone because they want to complain about something they don't like. But all you folks are here tonight to say what a great job it is, what, how they've come, they've come to our community, they've used our local professionals, they've worked with our design team through, this, through the staff through uh, thousands and thousands of dollars and different uh, 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 modifications to get this to work. Uh, yeah, there's modifications to this project. This project has never been built before in our city. And so that our designs obviously can't meet every th requirement for this particular type of subdivision. Does it work? It, it works. D is, are the speed limits at 10, uh, 15, 20 miles an hour? Yes. Those site limitations, those setbacks are not just for landscaping, but they're also for safety. And I don't believe safety is going to be an issue on this. The landscaping was taken away because we asked for parking. So that was a modification right there that, that is, a, is a result from what we asked for. I asked for a studies uh, uh, place for the kids. They, they easily made that happen. They've, everything that we've asked this company to do, they have done. And now they're here after spending all this money and time with a community that wants this project and I'm, and I'm hearing a lot of things that I, I didn't expect to hear tonight. Um, uh, the modifications, yeah, it's going to have to be modified. It's, it's not something we've built before. Uh, as far as competition, this is America. Competition is what we do. So if these people have a product and it is better than someone else's product and they can rent it out, then yes, that's the way it works. And if they set the price at that particular project, then that's what that particular project is going to be market rate for. And will it affect the others? It very well may. Is that the way our system works? Yes, that's the way we're set up in America. It's competition. So I, I don't understand that particular argument. Um, the ADUs, if we don't address these now, we will be addressing them later with absolutely no It'll be willy-nilly, it'll be one person here, one person there, they won't have to put a driveway, they won't have to have any parking. Uh, I mean, this, this project has addressed some of the situations that we've had as commissioners. We've had things taken away from us as far as what we can actually say yes to because of the state. We had a project come by us the other day, and, and, the, and the question was, well, we want to make small lots, so that we, and, but we're going to increase the density. And then the argument was, well, we want bigger lots. And then, well, if we give them bigger lots, they can all build ADUs. And then we've, we've actually cut our own throat by making the bigger lots. So it's a very complicated situation to be a planning commissioner these days and to try to make these decisions based on what the state has taken away from us as far as our, our powers. But I've never seen a project come before us with more public support, with more effort to meet the needs of our own community by, by hiring local people and by listening to all the study sessions that we had and then coming back with us with a project that they feel is going to be accepted to our community. And now we're going to say, well, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not quite sure about this stuff. So I'm, I'm having a problem with that to be honest with you. We, 
I feel that when these people come to us from a study session standpoint, that's when we got to bring this stuff up. If we're not going to approve a project, we, we, they're spending thousands and thousands of dollars with their uh, clients, with their architects, with their civil engineers, with everybody involved. So I don't feel it's right for us as a body to string projects along only to come back and say, yeah, it's a good project, but you know, I, I just don't like it today. So I'm having a real issue with that one. Um, I'm, I'm actually a little upset. Um, we we don't have many projects with so much public support. So um, I, I support this project. I think that this this company has done a good job developing this project, working with our local community, working with our local staff, looking and, and then looking at the bigger picture of just giving us big lots and then having people come in and fill in ADUs that they want to fill in. At their, because we've had this discussion before between the commission. So is that what we really want? Do we want, do we want, do we want people to come in and just do their own thing? Or do we want a nice community that's planned well, that has everything that's needed for a community, like any townhome project, any rental unit that, that we've ever passed in our community? I, 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 I just don't see the hesitancy here. So me, I, I'm, I'm for this project. And if it takes a continuation tonight to keep this project alive or whatever, I'd, I'd really like to hear it from you people because uh, from what I'm hearing tonight, I'm not sure with which way this vote's going to go. So if we, if we bring up a motion, uh, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm, I'm really at a loss for this one. I, 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 I'm not sure which way would it to head because uh, uh, it's an important project. That's, that's where I'm at. May I ask of the applicants um, if, um, if it were to break against you or continue it, so then my, maybe myself and uh, Commissioner Blanco's uh, um, concerns could be addressed by staff and by the applicant. Would, would that be acceptable to, to do a, a motion for a continuation so we can um, deal with those things? Uh, so there's, it, uh, thank you very much for allowing us to come back up, Commission. Uh, Absolutely. It, it sounds like there's two issues here that are part of the dis dialogue that's going on. One of them is the design issue, and um, you know, the project's not going to change. Um, this is what we're bringing forth to you. Um, the accessory dwelling units are allowed by state law. Um, the um, amenities that have been provided are over and above what is required, particularly with the parking and the covered parking and everything else for the ADUs. So um, the real question is um, in regards to the concern about rental. Uh, we could pursue um, and look at other communities and see what has, you know, how these have happened. But uh, I think one of the things that the Planning Commission needs to understand is m probably at least 40% of the housing stock in the city of Santa Maria are rentals already. And so you need to look at what's already existing in your community and this is just a different product coming to the city of Santa Maria. And it's not going to have a dramatic effect on the rental product because they're already, it's already out there. And whether it's the apartments, the single family, the townhomes, most of the product is rental, or I'm sorry, there's a predominant of re rentals already in the community. We can look at that information, bring it back to you, uh, talk to the property management people in this town, as well as others that have had built to rent. I think it's a piece of information for you, but the project itself, it, you know, we've, we've already lost some lots in this project to accommodate some of the things that the Planning Commission has asked for. And um, the project works and it addresses so many of the issues that the city has been dealing with already um, with ADUs. And um, in regards to the specific plan, which, you know, Dana wrote, I helped, 
Um, this project from the streetscape will look like a single family lot subdivision. The way it's designed and the way it is um, you know, accommodated within the project, it will look like a single family lot subdivision. From the back, you will have an ADU and you'll have that additional driveway, but from the streetscape, it will look like a single family lot. And that's the um, purpose of the design of this project. And you can see from the um, il illustrations that were provided here, what the streetscape would look like. So I, I hope that will be a consideration when um, looking at how we took this specific plan and implemented it with this project and realizing that state law, since that specific plan was written, state law has stepped in on the ADU issue. So it preempts what the specific plan says. So we, those are the combination of things that we're dealing with here with this project. So um, Tomas, Jared, um, obviously we want our approval tonight. That's our request. We think you can approve this project and um, you know we will uh, listen to what you have to say. Yeah, um, and thank you everyone for your comments. And I think uh, Commissioner Blanco, I just wanna really address uh, the modifications. Um, because the two mod there are four modifications being requested of this project, two of them a direct result of requests made by this planning commission uh, for ADU parking. We could have absolutely not provided the parking, not even shown the ADU, and built them after construction. We, we don't think that that's the right thing to do. We think that the right thing to do is to plan for impacts. You mentioned the density. This, we, we are planning for the impacts of the additional density. It's not double the amount. Um, you don't have five, six people living in a one bedroom, ADU, but there are impacts and we are planning for that with the additional amenities and the additional parking. So strip away those two modifications that are a direct result of the parking, the landscape reduction and the encroachment into the side yard setback. And what you're left is with two modifications. One of them is one lot of site distance uh, uh, requirements, not, not meeting that. It's lot 54 and it's at the entrance to the site where there is a gate Engineering has looked at this. This is a safe uh, 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 modification that, they, that, we, that we feel you guys don't need to consider. Um, it's one lot, one lot out of 105 with a site distance encroachment. The other modification, which are the side yard setbacks of those 19 feet on the corner, they're not all nine foot uh, encroachments. They range and there are about 12 of them. This, th these are not many modifications the way it looks out to be once you strip away those additional parking that we're providing, which are causing two modifications. The, the, the additional encroachment of the, of, the, uh, of the carport, a direct ask of this body, and we've met that requirement. So we, like Lori said, we would like you guys to approve it tonight. We think you can. Um, and I'll let Jared kind of speak to Commissioner Dickerson's um, uh, uh, comment on the, on the rental market. And I think he can provide a lot more clarification than I, than I can. This is his expertise. Thank you again. Hi, uh, Jared Brenner Goldstein, uh, Managing Principal of the Applicant Canfield Development. Um, you brought, brought up some really good questions and points about uh, rental housing in single family homes. We actually, in our presentation, if you could pull it up, we brought a chart of the housing stock in America in our appendix. Is that is that possible to bring that back up on the screen? I just want to check with the chair um, if I can bring that up. Uh, I, don't, I would like to see it. So I, I wanted to bring up this chart because this, um, this built for rent that we've brought up sounds very new because this is the first period where people are building homes specifically to be rented. It's purpose built, cohesive communities, amenities for their residents designed to be effective in that product and have a professional company deliver those services in the best management possible. But 
renting single family homes is already a huge, huge part of the housing stock. And I just want to walk through this chart. We actually hired a consulting company called John Burns Consulting, who's one of the largest consultants to the public home builders and uh, has been on the forefront of the new uh, build for rent industry. In the United States, there's 144 million housing units. About 13 million are vacant. Um, of the ones that are occupied, there's about 130 million. Of that, 85 million are owned and 45 million are rented. So nearly a third of the single family housing stock in the United States is already rented. The only difference that this project brings is rather than dispersed people renting from owners who may be providing them good service, they may not, they probably don't have online application portals where they can apply, pay their rent, put in management requests. This is a more efficient version of that. And about one in every three single family homes you see walking down the street, average in America, is already being rented. All, our project is really not that innovative. All it's doing is bringing a cohesive professional service with amenities so that they're not dispersed between communities in one in every three homes, they're all in one place. I think another thing that this rental product brings is, and we heard this, and this is a big reason this industry has started, is when they're dispersed in owner communities, there's um, the people at times are looked down upon by the people that say, I'm the owner and this is the renter. And so when a third of them within our community in there, they're not as welcome. When you have a community where everybody's in these homes, but everybody's renter, renters, nobody's better than anybody else. Nobody gets looked down upon by the HOA or treated differently. And I think this solves that problem for people in the situation who are, don't know they're gonna be somewhere 10 years, they're only gonna be there for a few years, or they're in a stage of life where they're trying to graduate to be a homeowner, but, but past the stage where they need to be in an apartment. Um, it, it truly, truly meets what they call the missing middle of housing. Now there's a lot of this being built in America right now where it originally was built as for sale because of interest rates and what's going on, it's not selling. So the homes are being rented, but when it's presented to the commission in whatever town or city they were in, it was put as for sale housing, but it's being rented because that's the need that it has. And that's what what this project brings. So I, I know we talked a lot about the damage that having for rent housing could do, but so much of it already exists. And you mentioned about the underwriting, I, I can tell you because I had this approved. Our underwriting, we just un underwrited inflation levels. It's at 3%, which is now under current inflation. You can't really get anything better than that approved by the pension funds and people that invest in projects like this. You can't be overly optimistic. If it gets to a point where there's such a shortage of housing and they're able to increase rents four or five percent or something more than the three percent that was underwritten, they're going to charge whatever the the whatever the market will with the project. They they just will and whatever that's um, available. But. The real thing that's gonna make it so the rent increases are as small as possible here is all the yeses you give. Not just to us, to the next person and the next person at that. And if a lot of projects are approved, it will make it impossible for not just us, landlords in that area to increase rents. There'll be too many housing choices for the applicants. The reason you're seeing large increases is because there's a lot of no's. Projects are taking a long time. There aren't a lot of projects like this that are for rent. It takes a long time to build apartments. There are supply chain shortages. The more units you deliver, the more choices people have. And this is an important project that gives people more choices. And just like this, each time you approve one of these, it makes it harder and harder for that next person to raise rent any more than the level of inflation or even at all in some cases. So I, we, we really appreciate all the time you've put into this. This is a new thing to wrap your head around in the way that's being delivered, but it's not a new thing in the United States. And you know, I, I think supporting projects like this and supporting all housing projects are actually going to be the solution, not the problem. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any discussion? Do I hear a motion? I would like to, I'd like to comment on um, the, la the last two speakers. Um, I'm sorry, sir, what was your name? Uh, Jared. Jared, I'm sorry, Jared and Lori. You know, it, it's not that I, it's not that I know that these, that the, the rents are gonna go up. 
I, it's not that I know that it's going to wash across the city. I'm concerned. That's all. I'm just concerned. And, and concerned enough that I would hope that we could take just a little bit of a breath to find statistical information. I'd like staff to, to find that if possible. But as, as Lori brought up, she says 40% of, of the homes are rentals in, in the city of Santa Maria. That is exactly my concern. The difference is that there are 40% dispersed amongst a scat of landlords. My concern is that by putting so many units under one landlord, that they have the ability to affect the baseline rents throughout the city because all they need to do is just raise the rents a little bit and then all the other people go, oh, well, if I can get that much for a two bedroom home, that's great. And the problem is that we do have a, we do have a problem with not enough housing and that's, and so you would say, well, it's counterintuitive because if you bring more housing in, it's gonna drive the prices down, maybe. And maybe that would be the case if it was dispersed amongst a lot of landlords, but if it's just one landlord, do you create a de facto monopoly? Do you, for all intents and purposes, the ability to affect the other rental prices in the market, which then snowballs and comes back to you because they've all raised their prices, and then next year, you're able to raise it a little bit more again. So this isn't an issue of capitalism, and it's not an issue of you know, this is the free market economy. It is the potential issue of a, of a large landlord affecting all of the rentals. And that's, that's the difference. That is the difference. Because the difference is you have one landlord that is setting a price that other people might follow suit with. And that's what's happened in some other communities. So th that's, that is my, my concern on the thing. Um, will it happen? I can't guarantee it will, but I also can't guarantee it won't. I mean, wouldn't it be nice to actually just have some statistical information rather than saying, wouldn't it be great to have an athletic park and some additional trees? We all know that these amenities are wonderful, but to a certain extent, you wait. You wait another hearing or two down the road so that we know statistically, or we can just say, oh no, that's not gonna happen. And when it does, who do we go to? Who, who do we go to of all of those tenants that have been edged up? I don't know that it'll happen, but I'm concerned enough. And I, and I get what Commissioner Seaford is saying, and I, and I am angst-ridden over it as well. You guys came to us and gave a, and, and we said, well, we need this, that, the other thing. Now, I, I did, in fairness, I did bring this same topic up, perhaps not as vehemently, but I brought it up at one of the um, uh, study sessions. Nobody kind of listened to it, and that's fine. But um, we're here now, and this is the only time that I have to make, to make this point. And if we make a mistake now that breaks to the negative, it's going to, I tell you, we're, we're going to feel, we're going to feel pretty awful about that. So that's my comment. I just uh, attended a uh, housing seminar with uh, Carvajal and Lamone, Senator and Congressman, and the Colonel from the base. And um, we're at a tipping point here in, in, the, uh, in the Central Coast. We can either choose to have housing and bring people in, or we can choose to shut it down and not. And if that's what we do, then the base will be affected. The people that they're bringing in will be affected. If he can't make a good uh, pitch for the country, for this base, for Vandenberg Base, they're not bringing in 500 people. They, they will go somewhere else. So if, if Lompoc, Santa Maria, the surrounding towns, don't have somewhere for these people to live, these professionals that can afford these houses, 
that for all the reasons we've heard tonight, they need these houses for coming into the community. I, I don't know how many people that I've met in this community that I have no idea where they're at or what they're doing. They've been in here. We got to be friends. They were here for three or four years. They, they, they filled out their term with the Air Force, and they're gone. They're on in their next assignment. Uh, this, 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 to me, would be an excellent place for them to land while they're here. Uh, I, I just don't, I, I don't see the issues there. I, I see it as a, as a good project and something that's needed for our community, that's supported by our community. Uh, Dana, have we had any negative comments on this from the community? No, I mean, for this hearing, the, the three letters I received, I discussed, and then we had the public comment today. All positive. Yeah, they were in favor of the project. Yeah, they were in favor. How, how many projects do we come up when no one in the community is, is, is or, or without anybody coming out and saying no, that they're in favor? I mean, in my experience, I've only been here for five, five six years. People come out to say no. They don't come out to say yes. The, so the support here in our community, I mean, people want this. They understand that it's a good project. They understand that it's different. They understand that we don't understand it and that we might not want to, we might not want to be the renters there. But there are people that need those projects, that, that, need, that need that product. So, um, yeah, I, I think we're at a, uh, I think they're offering us something that, that is, a gift for our community to get these people in. You know, I, these 500 square foot units that we're approving all over town, the, the, the thing down there by the airport center, the old airport center, all those apartments with 300 and 500 and a half a space here for parking. Uh, and, oh, we got all these new professionals coming in. We got the, we've got a bunch of young kids that we're going to stick in a little tiny square and then pack them in. I've been working in Oxnard lately. And when you go, when you, the minute you get to Wagon Wheel Road, they are building the most horrendous thing I've ever seen in my life. They're, they're, I don't know how many stories up. They're packed to, together. And, and these people are, are just, that's where they live. That's where they do. They got underground parking. Uh, I mean, they, they don't have any of these amenities. They don't have any open space. They don't have any barbecues areas. You know, it, it's, it's the oddest thing when I go to another town and I see what we have here to offer. And these guys are offering us what we've asked for. We, we've asked for single family homes. We've asked for uh, some control over the ADU situation. And we're getting that with this project. Uh, the ADUs to me are a mess. The state requirements, uh, they take away everything, all of our powers. The, the five story stack thing that's going out there by the old office building, uh, restaurant. Uh, we, 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 didn't, we couldn't even talk about that. We couldn't even say anything about that. It's, it's, it's approved by the state. And, and here we have a project that meets almost all of the standards that we want to see, and we're questioning it. So uh, I, I just think it's a good project for our community. I don't have the concerns that you have about in the future. Uh, well, I don't know the future. I don't control the future. Um, and, and I think that... Uh, if you would have told me uh, four years ago that I was going to be paying $5.59 for a gallon of diesel fuel, I'd have laughed. I said, oh, my God, that can't happen. But it has. Now, is that anyone's fault? I, I don't know. Uh, can we control that? Probably not. So trying to control the rental market through this project, I, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, the, the, the way that the market works isn't based on whether we're going to approve this or not. The, the market is the market. It's going to set its own rate. The rental rates are going to be what they are. When I came to this town, my house was worth $100,000. $100, now it's worth $650,000. Um, I've been there for 40 years. So, uh, I mean, w would I ever guess that my house would be worth that much? No. So we, we don't really have control over this, and the, and the control that these guys have over this market, it's their rental units, and, and they're going to go at a market rate, and if they make the rent too high, people won't rent them. I mean, that's, that's the way things work. So uh, I, 
I'm ready to approve this project, uh, but I, I don't hear that kind of support for it here. So uh, I, don't, I, don't, I'm, I don't have anything more to say. Um, uh, yes, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say that I do agree with um, Chair Seifert that, um, you know, I, uh, I really appreciate Canfield um, involving locals in developing this neighborhood for us. And I do also appreciate the fact that it's going to increase the walkability of neighborhoods, specifically that one being gated and then the parks for families. I feel like that's going to really increase the safety. Um, I just think it's, it's a beautiful development, and I think that's something that we would find comparable in L.A. or Orange County. You, you find, you stumble upon those kinds of developments, and um, it's nice to have that in Santa Maria. The, the community does need that, and I, I support it, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. So um, we're done talking, so we need a motion, or, uh, yeah, who's going to make a motion? What are we going to do? I'd like to make a motion that we continue this project for whatever length of time staff feels that they would need to look into this industry and get some sort of historical, uh, and, um, historical empirical statistics and then bring it back. Do I hear a second? Well, I second that motion, but I'd like to add that not just well, um, that's not my main concern. My main concern is compliance with the specific plan, which is what we're here to evaluate. And the concerns that I have regarding that, I mean, I brought up a setback that I don't think we really were aware of until I guess I mentioned it. But also the purpose and what's in the specific plan seems to me that um, if we're not meeting that, it's problematic, right? Because we have other areas and other specific plans that we could be setting a precedent for, right? I mean, so what's what's the point of a specific plan if we can't be specific and tied to it? And that's really my concern. I mean, that's that's what we're up here to do, right? Is to judge uh, not on the market rates or anything like that, and, and you know, theories about economics and you know whatever. But I'm here to evaluate things based on. Um, the documents that are required to be complied with. So I, I, I don't see that that's happening right now, and I, I'd like to see that unfold in the next meeting. Um, and so that's, I, I second the motion, but m my real basis is, is, is that, really. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Dickerson? Aye. Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Mohajer? Aye. Chair Seifert? No. Sounded like the motion passed, I think. It did. Mm -hmm. What's the, what would be a reasonable time period for you guys to look into this? I don't know. Um, we'll have to try to, we'll have to talk about it. Um, we don't, I'll have to continue it off calendar because I, we'll have to research and look into that information. It's more of an economics question, and so it may take us some time to do that. Okay. Um, may, may we make a request? Please do. Uh, we believe we have enough information, um, as indicated by just the slide that Jared provided, that um, we could come back to the next meeting um, which I believe is April 5th, uh, to um, respond to the comments that were provided here. Um, if uh, we do uh, also have another project coming before you for lot seven in, um, in a couple of, in the near future. So, um, you know, we're, we're moving these projects forward. They're, they're all coming to you over the next um, couple of months. And so we want to be able to allay your fears, address your concerns, and um, move the rest of the project forward so that we can provide the park that Alex is waiting for and, and a number of other things. It's all contingent on these projects getting approved. So um, we're ready to um, address the comments that were made based on the continuance and hope that we can address the concerns. Thank you very much. Thank 
Thank you. Commissioners, Ms. Tamura has asked for a continuance to April 5th. I will um, not be here for that meeting. Okay. So. Um, I, 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 would like, I would like staff to have enough time to be the ones to put together the report and certainly with input from, um, from the applicant if they have statistical information, but I, I would like staff to have enough time to, to give us the report. I would like it to be a staff driven report. Okay, thank you. Chair Seifert, if I may interject to. Um, yes. Uh, Commissioner Blanco also raised some items that he would like some additional mm -hmm. um, look into. Uh, so I think it'd be better to just continue it. And then if, if staff can get that all assembled and done, whenever they can, then they will bring it back. I don't know that we want to uh, put that tight of a constraint on staff to commit to that next meeting. I don't know if those things will be able to get done by then. Thank you. You agree with that, Tana? Chair, can I add something real quick too? Please. Um, you know, obviously it'd be good to have a full slate of uh, commissioners, so I don't know if it's possible to verify if Commissioner uh, Lopez would be available to attend. I, I think that would be... I, I don't believe he can attend. Well, uh, well, I, I believe that there was going to be a verification of that potentially. So, I don't know. I'm just saying it'd be good to have a We can see if there's any change in that. Yeah. That's all. Just to give the, the applicant a full slate of commissioners. I think it's fair. Okay, this item is over. Um, do we have any oral reports on, from the Planning Commission and staff? So, um, thank you for the staff report. Um, our next, well, so our, our study session tomorrow is canceled, so we won't be meeting tomorrow. Our next hearing then is April 5th, and at this point we just have the one item that was continued from tonight, which is the concert fuel uh, canopy replacement. <coughs> Um, so we'll be meeting on April 5th for that item. And we don't have any study session items yet either for April 6th. So at this time, I'm anticipating we would cancel that date. Um, and that's, the, that's my report for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any uh, commissioners or reports? Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>